Workshop. This uh, we're doing the fifth edition of the Valencia Winter Workshop in fall, or in the autumn. It's never in winter, <laughs> and sometimes not even in Valencia. But uh, you know, it's just a name. So the important thing is that we are uh, gathering uh, some, you know, people. Uh, many we have many talks. We have three the complete days with many talks. So we hope we, hope we have time. To, to have uh, discussions after the, the talks, because 30 minutes uh, on average is not too much, but I think it's, it's probably enough. And uh, we have many different topics, you know, from gravitational waves, uh, compact objects, uh, stellar structure, uh, 
gravitational collapse, uh, vertical fine theories, torsion, many, many different things, uh, approaches to quantum gravity uh, and quantum fields in curved space. So it's very varied. This is why the, the, the workshop has this last name, this uh, on theoretical physics. It's not just on gravitational physics. We, everybody is welcome. And uh, well, since we don't have, uh, since it was a bit late because of traffic, uh, so I think it's time to, to start. And our first speakers will be uh, Flavio Bombacino and uh, Simon Boudet, who are going to dance together in this nice <laughs> uh, couple system of talks. <laughs> okay, so give me high five. Go ahead. Thank you. So let's try some stuff here. Is it working? Can you see? Okay, let's start. Okay, perfect. So now, like the title suggests, basically here we deal with two key ingredients that are Persimon's gravity, so Persimon's third in the action for gravity, and quasi number balls or black balls. Now, uh, we have quite but in two parts. The first one is my concern, and the second one is so not. In the spirit of this conference, these are. Uh, in the sense, the, the merciful. And let's start. So, why we choose to address transcendent gravity, and what does it mean? address some gravity. Basically relies on the inclusion of this kind of term. I don't know if you can see from there. Okay. Okay. So so the inclusion of this very kind of term in the action is basically a high of the correction to a standard GR action. But the I don't want to enter too much in detail the technical stuff it's, it's boring. But the, the main reason for including this type of term in the action is the fact that it seems to emerge in very, very different kind of theory of gravity. For example, mm, well, also it seems to emerge from very different areas of algebra physics. For example, when we deal with a well known uh, cardiac anomaly in quantum field theory, this kind of term is uh, mandatory to uh, deal with equity. Within the theory, and in particular, <clears throat> when we try to put the up, a counter term in the action for Q, this type of anomaly, we need to include a term that is proportional to the chair Simon's term. Little warning, I will use in the same, uh, in the same meaning chair Simon's term or von Kragen density, so don't be scared. <clears throat> so, this term is a, a we need to start purely target uh, anomaly, but also when we uh, look at some some method for treating quantum gravity, for example, string theory or loop quantum gravity, this type of thought seems to emerge as well. For example, when we deal with um, the history in 10 dimension and we compactify the, the theory to four dimension, aiming to reproduce GR, again, Procuring a sort of anomaly that we have also in theory, we need to add this term. Or, for example, lastly, or maybe more importantly, when we work with loop quantum gravity, which is one of the terms to quantize gravity, when we include uh, fairness in the theory and we work with the so called neon term, which basically is a term which includes torsion and other mega fine terms. We, we found out that when we look at the effective theory, we, again, <laughs> we end up with this type of terms. So it seems that it's a quite a general feature of a lot of different theories of quantum gravity or quantum field theory on space time. So it, for this reason, it looks like reasonable to work with this type of modification to GR. Well, here, for the sake of completeness, we include also the term, professional term, but they are not really important. The main 
things I want to discuss with you is the fact that this uh, is to be quite a general feature of a lot of theory. Now, um, guided by, by this, let's say, gauge principle, principle we, we choose to enlarge our radical framework working not with metric approach, I mean, with only the metric field as a fundamental variable, but also enlarging our perspective by considering uh, the Riemann field as, a, as like a strand field for the connection. So we are working with a metric affine framework where we have metric field and connection. Now, it's clear that when we deal with this very kind of approach, this term, <laughs> does not respect a fundamental symmetry that in the last years seems to be a rise in the context of high gravity, i.e. referring to projective invariance, which is basically the invariance of the reaction by this type of shift in the, in the connection, which is basically ruled by a vector shift. So um, our idea was to try to implement this type of symmetry in this action. And we immediately see that when we only work with this type of correction, this term does not respect this symmetry. Only it respects the symmetry when we deal with, with a very specific kind of projective symmetry where the, this vector psi is proportional to the derivative of scalar field. But it's a very, very strict request. So we try to implement this symmetry in a wider sense. How can we do this? Well, we can check that when we try to generalize the Chertsan term this way, so by including the Riemann tensor, but also contraction with the other traits of the Riemann tensor that we have. In Magic of fine mechanism, we can try to include the Vinci tensor and the only curvature in the now modified transform term. But when we explicitly do the calculation, we find out that the tests by preserving this type of symmetry are quite stringent in the sense that all these terms are actually restricted to basically just two types of additional contraction. Which are guided by the coefficient so that we basically end up with modification, which is ruled by a coefficient in front of the homogeneity curvature and another coefficient in front of the Riemann tensor contraction. So, even if we started by including in a reaction a lot of different terms, we just end up with two types of contraction the Riemann tensor and the homogeneity curvature. Obviously, this somehow reproduces the metric result in the sense that when we look at the metric version of this theory, the metric curvature is vanishing, so we just get the Riemann tensor solution. And we easily see that the addition of this, this type of term does not affect the, the other request that we, we need when dealing with this type of theory, I mean, probability. So the fact that when we just consider uh, a constant coupling in front of this term, this does not affect the classical equation motion in general. So, by summing up, we have an additional term, which in the, in the case of constant coupling uh, does, not, does not affect the dynamics. We have a theory that now is a projective invariant, so perfect. <clears throat> but the the question still, still remains in the sense, why do we choose, choose to implement this type of term? It is also motivated by the fact that when we look at the symmetry property of this term, we easily see that this, uh, uh, part, this has an odd parity. So what does it mean? It means that when we look at uh, space signs that which are endowed with the uh, for example, static symmetry, we already know that this term does not affect at all the dynamics because it is identically vanishing for symmetrical space times. So we can guess that, for example, the Russian solution has two solutions of a theory. But when we look at space times 
for example, care types for times, which explicitly violate this type of symmetry. We already know that this, this curve is not vanishing, so we expect, in some sense, that this curve can be fundamental for finding another type of solution with respect to the care solution. And more specifically, we hope, let's say, that this curve can affect the, the, the theory in such a way that we can model modifications and perturbations from the care black hole with this, this, this type of theory. So these are the main reasons for working in this in this context. Now, oh, so like I, I told you, we, we choose to work with this type of theory. So now you, know, you can see we just have the, the Riemann tensor contraction and the amortized curvature contraction with basically the other trace that we can Take on the first two indices because I remind you that we are working in the magical time formalism, so the symmetries of the Riemann tensor are not concerned with respect to the metric case. So we can take this trace in this case, it's not punching. And just for sake of um, completeness, we include also, also this kinetic term. Simon um, uh, is going to discuss the property of this, this term, so uh, we'll see later. Now, we put uh, two different constants in front of the two different uh, terms, so a coupling alpha and a coupling beta. And we put here uh, the scalar theory that uh, will play a fundamental role in our theory. Now, uh, how, we, how can we actually solve this very intricate type of theory? Well, with respect to the major case, we have an uh, additional variable. Connection. So when we vary this type of action with respect to the fundamental variables of the, our theory, we have to take into account also connection. But with respect to the metric case for simply Palatini case or the formulation of Palatini formulation GR, we have for the, the connection a very, very intricate some equation, the means equation. So we can see on the left hand side the Standard terms you get when we deal with, for example, Palatini formulation of GR. But on the right hand side, I put all the, the terms that comes out from this variation. The additional terms we get from, from the action. And we you see that we actually are dealing with a, another other equation for the connection because. Here we have linear terms in the connection, but here we have second order terms in the connection. So the solution doesn't, doesn't look so simple. And also find an explicit solution is a very, very hard task. So the, the idea is to look for perturbative solution in which sense? Perturbative in the sense that we can make an ansatz, I guess, that this derivative, this color field theta is a sort of equivalent parameter. So the, the idea is to look for the solution <clears throat> in the scalar field. So we will make the guess that we have a background configuration for the scalar field, simply a constant, in the in such, a, such a way that when we just consider the, the constant value, we recover GR because we see that we, when we put here a constant, we just get the coordinate equation for the connection, so we can solve it. But when we consider a small perturbation in the star field, we have a, still a modification. And this enables us to consider solution. For this technical stuff, I will skip. So if you're interested, I will give you later privately more information, but the, the main idea is that when we consider the scalar field as a perturbation, we can actually solve the equation for the different components of the connection. So the electric components, the tensor components, and so on. And like you can see here, when we consider this like a perturbation, we can put in the, in the Riemann automatic contribution just uh, the metric version because we are considering a metric background, scalar field background, which is constant, and then we add up on this background a metric perturbation and a scalar field perturbation. So, at first order in perturbation, we just can retain in these terms the, the metric version of our curvature terms. 
if we do this, we see, for example, for what concerns the nomenclicity, that because we here we're dealing with a magic version of this Riemann tensor, we can spoil, we can restore to the the standard properties of the Riemann tensor. So the symmetry is in it is two indices uh, and other stuff. So we easily see that we can get easily a solution for the metric non metricity components. So that when we do this, we can find a complete set of solutions for closure and non-metricity. Quickly, we found out that the metricity is uh, vanishing. So it seems that the first order perturbation in theory is only endowed with torsion. And we can find out a strict solution for the axial part of torsion, which turns out depend only on the, the Einstein tensor with the cloud. And for the, the tensor part of the torsion, which similarly turns out to depend on the Riemann tensor and the Einstein tensor. Now, uh, in, principle, in principle, we have also the, the trace part of torsion, but because we are working in a projective uh, environment theory, we can use this additional symmetry that we have in theory to read off of these trace of the torsion. So, at first order, by summing up, we have for only tensor part and tensor part. So, the idea is the following we use this type of perturbative solution, we insert that in the metric equation and in the scalar equation, and we see what happens. So this is a non perturbative version of the, the metric equation, but when we refer the equation as well, we end up with the, the guide. Now, we call here we have the perturbed Einstein tensor, so it's a standard term, and here we have a sort of GC tensor, which mm, is not the custom, the ordinary in your tensor that we have in gravity, mean. But it has sort of modification of the sequence introduced that was introduced by Jack and P in 2003, in the sense that these additional term can be written like a sort of divergence of the torsion tensor. We can then, if we do explicitly the calculation, we found out that this term quite resembly, resembles the, the standard sequence that we have in metric version of our theory. Why I told you personally? Because if we do with more attention after this third, we see that the second part of this third is actually different in the sense that if we have a covariant derivative acting on, on the old Riemann tensor, while in the standard metric approach we have a covariant derivative acting on the, the rich tensor. And it looks like a, like a minor difference. And actually, when we deal with specific the ground, uh, it can it can happen that this term at, at the end of the calculation is the same, but in principle it can be different. So keep in mind this, this difference in our theory. So well, we have this equation for the scalar, for the magnetic field. Here we include all the contribution from market and also from the scalar field. I then view that we include included in the action also the connect that for the field. So here yeah, yeah, all the contribution. And when we do the same for the scalar field, we we get we got this equation. Now a few words about this equation. It seems that when we consider the limit of vanishing beta, we just uh, obtain the modified version of the contrary constraint that tell us that these contraction with metric uh, with curvature invariants are compared to the vanished. But I remember you that we actually solve at first order the, the connection components. And we we found that uh, this connection part depending in some in some way on the derivative of the scalar field. So Actually, we can expect that from when we put the the solution, the effective solution in this term, we expect that other kinetic current could emerge from this contraction. So also, when we consider 
let's say, the non dynamical approach in our theory, we still can recover a dynamical behavior uh, for the self -team. So the idea is now to choose a background for the metric. And obviously, uh, we are going to deal with the construction background. This enables us to find, find solution for the connection. We use the solution for the metric and the equation, and we, we see what happens. So, Simon, when do you want? Okay, so. So now the aim is to um, derive some predictions that allow us to distinguish this theory from standard general relativity case and even from the Chern Simons, the metric version of Chern Simons theory. And we do this studying uh, the evolution of both metric and scalar perturbations on uh, a black hole background. So uh, this is. The results of this analysis are well known in general relativity, where one can study the evolution of metric perturbation and also of a uh, simple Klein Gordon scalar field uh, perturbation on the Schwarzschild uh, background solution. And what one finds uh, is that the perturbation evolved with damped oscillations, uh, which are characterized by, uh, uh, by so called quasi normal modes which are identified by specific frequencies, which will have a real part and an imaginary part, of course. And, and then the other feature is that in the late time region, these perturbations uh, fold down with a power law K. So now the aim is to understand what happens in our case, both to scalar and tensor perturbations. And we do this um, choosing uh, the uh, background metric G bar mu nu as uh, the uh, Schwarzschild metric. And so on this background, uh, what you have is that the scalar field equation boils down to this expression, where you see that uh, first and second derivatives of the scalar perturbations appear, and here also the second derivative of the metric perturbation. And as Claudio said, you have a, a box term, which arises from the, the one with the kinetic term we added by hand in the action, but also another term uh, proportional to the box uh, via the crescent on scalar, which arises from these, from the, the derivatives of the scalar field, which are contained in this, in, in this uh, metric affine contribution. Okay, so uh, since we are dealing with spherical, spherical symmetric problem, it is convenient to uh, decompose the scalar field perturbation in, in standard spherical harmonics, YLM. And so here now the radial dependence is inside this function, capital theta. And the same decomposition can be applied to the metric perturbation, H mu nu. And here is when one is working with uh, quasi normal black hole quasi normal modes, it is convenient to adopt a specific gauge, which is called the Reggio Wheeler gauge. And in this gauge, the, uh, the metric perturbation H acquires this expression, where uh, the functions S are defined in terms of derivatives of the, of the standard spherical harmonics. And the radial dependence here is now encoded in the in six functions which are for H012 and K describe uh, polar perturbation, so even type of uh, perturbation, while the two functions H0 and 1 describe axial perturbations so, uh, that are uh, odd under parity transformation. Um, now, substituting these two, uh, these two expressions, into the scalar field equation and also into the metric field equation, one can uh, what one can show is that the two type the two different type of perturbations axial and polar decouples decouple. So and in particular, only the axial type perturbations are modified with respect to the standard case. And this is due to the fact that we are adding a parity violating term 
the action. So from now on, we focus only on axial type perturbations. And basically, uh, you can, from these three components of the metric equation, you derive these three equations. Uh, however, one is redund redundant since these relation holds between these two expressions. And uh, then one can solve this equation for H0 in terms of H1 and substitute back in E2. And what you get eventually is an equation, this one, 52, for uh, the H1 metric perturbation, which is redefined here in terms of the function. Okay, uh, so uh, you see that uh, there we have a non vanishing right hand side, which is a source term which depends on the scalar perturbation. And moreover, we uh, introduce the radio, the tortoise coordinate R star defined in the usual way. So one can do uh, similar with a similar procedure, you can derive also the, the equation for the scalar perturbation, which is this one, 53. And so bottom line, you have two uh, second order differential equations for the metric and scalar perturbations, which are coupled. So both you have a source term in both equations, which depends on the other variable. And this is main, the main difference with respect to the standard general relativity case, where this equation is the same, but with a vanishing right hand side, while this equation is simply given by this term in brackets equal to zero. Okay. So, so the aim now is to uh, numerically integrate these equations and eventually uh, uh, obtaining the uh, evolution of both perturbations as a function of time at some constant radius. And from these uh, time series, we want to extract what are the frequencies of the Poisson Norman modes rolling, rolling, characterizing the, the oscillations. So uh, in order to do that, it is convenient to proceed in the following way. So first of all, first of all, one can get rid of the one of the two parameters, alpha, simply rescaling the scalar field and the parameter b. So now you have just two uh, differential equations with one free parameter. Uh, then it proved in literature it proved um, uh, convenient to solve these equations working with light cone variables. So u equal p minus r star and b p plus r star. And here we redefine again q in terms of this new function psi, which is the metric perturbation now. And these are the equations you get where the potentials are just defined by these expressions. Okay. So uh, we integrate numerically these equations, simply discretizing the UV uh, plane with a lattice spacing delta. And these are the discretized version of the two equations, where subscript denotes that the field are computed at one of these four points. So UV, U plus delta, V, UV plus delta, and U plus delta, V plus delta. And once the, uh, given the value of the fields at the, third, at the three points S, W, and E, you can compute with these equations the value of N, and then increasing the value of B and then of U, you can complete the full U, V, V. So eventually you end up with theta and psi as functions of U and B. And from there, you can extract the value uh, of the fields as, as a function of time computing the fields at t minus r star, t plus r star with constant r star, okay? So we did, did, we did this for different values of beta. And here you can see an example of what we get. So this is for beta equal 1000. And you see both the module, the, the absolute value of the metric perturbation and the scalar field perturbation as a function of time. Uh, so you see, so this is for beta 1000. This is another example for a smaller value of beta than to max. And so you see that we get uh, qualitatively what, what the, the same result of general relativity in the sense that you have, uh, this is a log scale. So you have uh, uh, damped oscillations 
up to some time and then the uh, a power law tail at higher uh, at late times um so now given these time series we want to extract from the oscillating part the uh, quasi normal mode frequencies and we do this fitting the data uh, with two kind of functions depending on the value of beta so we use either a a two mode oscillations with both terms of this sum for n equal two or a single mode oscillation with n equal one. So, why this? Let me explain. Uh, so, first of all, what happens in the large beta limit is that the scalar field equation becomes this one, which is the same equation we, you get for a King Gordon scalar field on Schwarzschild ground. And in particular, you see that. The scalar field decouples from the metric perturbation. While the no matter how, the, how large beta is, the uh, equation for the metric perturbation is always coupled to theta. So, what you expect here is that theta will evolve with a, a single mode oscillation with frequency equal to the similar to the near the, the, the frequency of, uh, of the scalar mode of GR, while uh, uh, the metric perturbation is always coupled to theta, so it will evolve with a superposition of the gravitational uh, mode and the scalar mode, uh, which is present here in the source step. And this is what we get. So uh, we analyzing this uh, uh, this time series. Okay. What we get is that the uh, metric perturbation evolves as a superposition of these two modes, which are the gravitation and the scalar, or, and, and the scalar mode of frequencies of GR, while the scalar field only oscillate with, oscillate with a single mode, given only by the second uh, frequency. Um, then, if you decrease the value of beta, these uh, behavior changes, and also the scalar field becomes oscill start oscillating with a superposition of two modes. Uh, whose frequencies, however, uh, change with respect to these values and depends on the depend on the value, the specific value of the parameter beta. So here you see the result we get. Here you see the, in particular, the uh, real part of the frequency as a function of the parameter beta. So the dashed black lines are the values of uh, found in general relativity for the scalar. Uh, perturbation is the higher one and the tensor perturbation the one the bottom and while the blue uh, dots are the values we get and you see that for again scalar and tensor perturbations and again you see that for large beta you recover the general relativity prediction and here you see also comparison with the the orange curves are the results uh, found in literature for the metric version of chern simons theory. So we get predictions that differ both from GR and from the metric chern simons the metric version of chern simons gravity. So this is the real part, while concerning the imaginary part of the frequency, these are the results. It is still work in progress. In particular, we get for, for beta lower than 10 to the minus 5, uh, we get results that we're still trying to understand what, what's happening, but basically uh, what happens is that you have uh, both perturbations oscillating with a superposition of two modes. So for each beta, you have two values of the frequency, one extracting from, extracted from the, the plot of uh, the magic perturbation, one from the scalar perturbation. And in the the, the, the graphs I've shown you before, the, the two values are always in well agreement within each other, while here we start getting different values depending on, on whether you extract the, the frequency from the metric perturbation or the scalar perturbation. Um, okay, so eventually let me end with a few words on the power law tails. So uh, here we get uh, so uh, in both, in, in every case, uh, whichever the value of beta, power load, we always observe power load tails with this behavior, t to the minus p. Uh, what, uh, and the values of p we, we compute depends on whether beta is different from zero or equal to zero. And in particular, for beta different from zero and l equal to, 
we uh, obtain p plus to 6.5. Uh, but how, however, we uh, expect to uh, recover in the beta different from zero case the same results of general relativity in which p is equal to 7 or l equal to. So here we get a smaller value and we're still trying to figure out why. Uh, instead for beta equals zero, uh, we expect to get different results and we, have, we indeed get a, a lower value of p. So here, for instance, you can see that the, so here it's a log log plot. So the power of tail is just a straight, straight line. And you see that from beta equal to zero, the slope is different than from beta different from zero. And this is a, a, an effect that is present only in the affine version of Chern Simon's theory, while in the metric version, uh, you, you only get, uh, I mean, you, you don't have uh, modifications in the power law tail behavior, and the, the exponents are always the same as in the standard general relativity case, while here for beta equals zero, they can uh, differ. So that's all. Thank you. So let's start with a question, if any. Any curiosity here? Otherwise, I'm going to ask something to Simon. Okay. Yes, Simon. Uh, I didn't get uh, correctly what you're saying. Uh, can you repeat again with the code that you are using? Uh, can you reproduce correctly the standard DR result? With the? With the code, the medical code that you're using. Okay. Uh, so the, the seven, the slope. No, the, the, the slope. Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. We, we still are getting a value which is a bit smaller. Um, okay. Not but, only for the transimons, but also for yeah, yeah, yeah. For the transimons, uh, we get a smaller value, but it's fine. We expect to get a smaller value, okay. while the the value we get for uh, in, in the mm -hmm. GR case is smaller and should be higher. Yeah. Um, I was wondering whether you can add some comments about the beta zero case. That's really yeah, so for what concern. Yeah, well, for the frequency. Okay. So here. Yeah, the, 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 it's good. It seems that uh, there is a smooth limit in these kind of results. So regarding the frequencies, it seems to, to be a smooth, smooth limit for. Uh, so actually here, uh, sorry, this plot is misleading. This last point is not 10 to the minus uh, 10, is precisely zero, okay? I, I plot here just to, to see it. But um, for beta equals zero, for, for the limit for beta that goes to zero, it seems that the frequencies are uh, uh, approaching a constant value, okay? Both the, the tensor and scalar. Uh, modes. And this is something that is possible only in the affine chern science uh, theory, because in the metric chern science theory, what happens if you take beta equal to zero is that uh, basically the metric chern science, oh, sorry, better hit. In the, in, the in the metric version of chern science theory, Beta equal to zero means that you lose this kinetic term for the scalar field, but you don't have additional derivatives of theta rising from here. So in some sense, theta uh, it's not a kinetic uh, term; it's not a dynamical scalar field anymore, and you are left with the with just a constraint on the uh, metric perturbation. While here. Uh, the, even the theory with beta equals zero is fine, and uh, and uh, in, even in that case, theta is endowed with a uh, proper dynamics. Okay, fine. Uh, no, you check if you have any questions. Oh, no, you can take it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So let's proceed with the next speaker, which is Spencer. Well, it's actually next year.
No, 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 Okay, sorry for the delay. Get you. Don't worry about it. Sí, ¿eh? no, o sea, no, pero, pero compártelo en el. No, sí, sí, no, estaba viendo si. Sí. Ah, vale. ¿Y cómo te lo voy? Ahí, exacto. Okay. Okay. So, fine. We can start. Uh, Fabio is going to. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, I'm Fabio Moretti, and thank you for having invited me to this workshop. And I will present you the gravitational beam plasma instability award that I'm carrying on with uh, Matteo Del Prede and uh, Professor Montani uh, from La Sapienza. is currently in progress and follows from a previous work that I did with uh, Flavio Bombacino and Professor Montani uh, last year. Well, in 2019, uh, to be honest where we demonstrated that uh, Landau damping can occur for the uh, massive, uh, um, massive uh, scalar uh, gravitational waves from, from, from Odensky theories, uh, contrary to what happens to the massless tensorial part of the gravitational waves from Odensky theory, or even from for the uh, gravitational waves from general uh, relativity. So uh, Landau damping is a uh, interesting
are the modes that can transfer energy from the beam through the wave to the plasma. So the mechanism is allowed basically only for the generated points. Now we study the, the, the properties of the of equation star is one in the neighborhoods of the degenerate point. We expand it up to third order in the in the deviation with respect to the degenerate point. And we solve this cubic, we find a single real solution and a couple of complex conjugates. This couple of complex conjugates demonstrate demonstrates that there exists a region of instability. Uh, around the degenerate point uh, connected to the solution with positive imaginary parts. We select this solution and we calculate its imaginary part in the degenerate point, so in delta k equal to zero. And this is the, the analytic expression of pain, which we used it as a, a guide, uh, a tool to understand better what we, we were finding when we eventually end up with numerical techniques on the equation star. Ah, this is the, the form of, the, of this quantity in, in terms of the, as a function of the beam velocity. You see that a maximum value for this quantity is reached when we, you consider a beam velocity slightly bigger than the, the minimum one, and it rapidly vanishes when you consider uh, beam velocity going to the speed of light. So last section, the numerical analysis we're implementing on the, on the dielectric equation. So in this case, the beam is uh, described as a trapezoid in the momentum space. So you can play with three parameters, which, is, which are the beam momentum, the major basis, and the minor basis. The ratio between the beam momentum and the major basis give, gives you the spreading, the temperature of the of the of the beam. So whether it, it is a, a quasi delta or a very hot beam, and the, the ratio between the two bases gives you the 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 way in which you are modeling the beam. You can go from a, a box shape to a triangular shape to uh, a, a trapezoid which uh, is as similar as possible to a Gauss distribution. Okay, the, the electric function that you obtain with the trapezoid is that the nice thing is that the, the integrals contained in the electric equations can be uh, turned into uh, this simpler one by uh, going to the velocity domain. And these integrals can be exactly calculated so that the total distribution function equation uh, equal to zero is uh, translated into a non algebraic equation, but an equation that do not contain integrals. So the numerical uh, effort uh, is not so uh, severe. And what you do is to restore, restore the complex frequency in its real and imaginary part, so that uh, the total directive function has a real and imaginary part, that you, of which you study the zeros at a definite k in the plane, uh, imaginary part of omega, real part of omega. So here we have two curves. In orange, the points at which the imaginary part of the directive function are zero is zero. In blue, the relative uh, real part of the directive function. In the intersection, you have both the real and imaginary part of the of the electric function be vanishing. So these are the solutions. Here we have a spreading very low, so it's a quasi delta uh, scenario. And here you have a single real solution, uh, another one, and the two complex conjugates. And you can play with the spreading so that for increasing spreadings, you see five times ten to the minus two and growing and growing and growing. You have a dynamics of these solutions. You see the, the real solution that was here in the ribbon, it was a single one. Then splits for increasing redshift into two real solution that gets separated and separated till the higher one gets confused and becomes undistinguishable with this one for a, a great spreading. 
What you can do is also fix a spreading and uh, trace uh, the behavior of a single solution in the K uh, domain, in the wave number domain, so that so in order to obtain the dispersion relation and the enhancing rate for that solution. This is the study that we've done on the on the unstable solution, the one characterized by positive imaginary part, of course. And then you can uh, make these two games together and uh, study the uh, plot of the imaginary part of the frequency for the unstable solution on all K and for different uh, spreadings. In this plot, you have uh, starting from uh, a quasi delta beam to hotter and hotter beams. So you see that uh, the, the magnitude of the effect uh, becomes. Uh, lower and lower with increasing spreading so this is uh, the end of this talk and when we have ended up uh, with this work uh, at, at present so i thank you for your attention so any questions here There are any astrophysical context where this kind of yeah, uh, yeah, uh, well, given that we we always looked at non-collisional uh, material media, uh, the, the the most serious candidate uh, that uh, we can affirm that it can be. Uh, satisfactorily described by this kind of analysis is the dark matter medium, which in all epochs, in all cosmological epochs, uh, is a, a non-collisional medium. So uh, this kind of, uh, of setting can uh, uh, arise when you consider a background, a thermalized background of, of dark matter, for example, the cosmological background, and you superimpose on it a uh, past population uh, injected from an external source. <laughs> And this can be a realistic physical scenario when you look at the physics of AGN, of jets, of uh, many astrophysical environments which allow for the presence of uh, a fast population of particles super superimposed to a, a background uh, existence. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Uh, I think we can proceed. So Paula Stiger. Yes, you did. I think you have your presentation already. Yeah, already. Yeah, it is. Perfect. Okay, don't need it. You're going to talk at. Oh, you need it. Igual que no hay mucho que no que no hay mucho que no hay que See, so the addition domination dominated the universe. So, part of your theory in Cooper grounds, I suppose. Yes. So, okay, thank you, Claudio. So, I want to present uh, the work that we are currently doing together with Powell Dan, Silvia Plan, Jose Navarro, Salas, who is the supervisor of the three of us. And in this talk, uh, I will proceed to construct a vacuum in a normal in a radiation dominating universe to find a natural uh, vacuum quantum state uh, and as if we will be doing uh, quantum field theory in a radiation dominating universe i will begin by introducing some uh, general ideas of quantum field theory in garbage space time and we will see how the ambiguity on fixing the vacuum arises already in Minkowski space time and we can fix it using the symmetries. 
And we will see the two basic conditions that any vacuum in curved space time has to satisfy, one of which is the regularization condition. So finite observables, well, observables have to be finite. And this is a condition that, that we have to, to take into account in any vacuum. And then I will proceed to show how to how to choose two natural vacuums, one in, in an adiabatic regime that I will show what it is, and then a natural vacuum in a radiation dominated universe. Okay, so let's proceed by beginning to uh, consider quantum field theory in a general kind of space time. So it is obviously a semi classical theory that can be generalized from quantum field theory in Minkowski space time, where we will have quantum matter fields. So we have to evaluate vacuum expectation values, and we have a dynamical classical background. So we promote uh, the Minkowski metric. To a dynamical uh, general metric. So, when doing quantum fields in car space time, two basic issues appear. One is the new ultraviolet, ultraviolet divergences appear at the vacuum level. So, we cannot perform uh, the usual normal ordering as in Minkowski, as in Minkowski space time because this can produce a gravitational effects through the semi classical gravitational equation. So, new methods of renormalization have to be considered. And the second, the second issue, which is the one that we will be more interested in this talk, is how to choose a preferred vacuum. In quantum field theory, in carbon space time, there is an ambiguity on how to choose the vacuum. And this is because if we consider, for example, Minkowski space time, as I will do in the following slides, we don't have concurrent variants in general, so we cannot have a unique and privileged definition of the vacuum. This indeed is linked to the fact that we can create particles out of the vacuum. This is the well famous uh, particle creation phenomena that it is, for example, famous in the Hawking radiation, but it is also uh, famous in the cosmological scenario where particles can be created due to an expanding universe. So, okay, let's emphasize this idea of the vacuum in Minkowski space time. So, we consider a scalar field. Living in Minkowski space time. So, in general, this Klein Gordon equation has a complete set of solutions in the following way. Where here I'm writing this alpha and beta explicitly, where alpha you see that is going with what we call the positive frequency solution. And we have also this beta. beta. So, one now would, could try to, uh, to input the canonical commutation relations with the annihilation and creation operators, and we, one would have many possibilities to satisfy these conditions, these commutation relations. However, if one considers that the vacuum or most solutions has to be concurrent invariants as the vacuum is concurrent invariants, I mean, the space-time contains this symmetry, this completely fixes this beta uh, to zero, and we end up just with the positive frequency solution. We here we have seen. So we expand the modes in terms of the annihilation and creation operators with a positive frequency solution and its complex conjugate. Okay. So as I mentioned, this Poincare space time symmetry univocally fixes a privileged vacuum. So we just have a global vacuum in Minkowski space time. However, if we don't have this Poincare symmetries, we see that there is an ambiguity on finding the vacuum depending on the parameters. Alpha and beta. So, in a general space time, in a dynamical space time, we don't have this Poincare symmetry. So, there is an, an inherent ambiguity on finding the vacuum, and there are infinite, infinitely many vacuum instances. However, there is two basic requirements that any vacuum has to satisfy. The first one is that the vacuum has to respect the space time symmetries, and the second is that it has to be ultraviolet regular. So the short distance behavior of the two-point function or uh, any observable has to be similar to that found to Minkowski space. So if we look locally, we should have Minkowski space, and the divergences should be locally those of the Minkowski space plus some other correlation due to the curve run. So we will stay with these two basic conditions, and we will proceed to analyze uh, a vacuum in a cosmological scenario, which is the, the Freeman Lemaire Robertson Walker space time. And specifically, we will, we will be interested 
in a radiation dominated universe. Why? Because radiation dominated universe could be regarded as a predecessor phase, for example, and we would like to fix uh, the vacuum at early times as P goes approaching to, to zero. Or it could be that a radiation dominated universe is an initial phase of the universe in alternative theories to inflation. So, whatever it is, it is uh, important to uh, fix a natural vacuum where at early times for the radiation dominated universe. So, what we will do is to recall these two uh, requirements that I already showed that any vacuum has to satisfy. And let's see how these requirements uh, look in a Freeman Lemaire Robertson Walker space time. So, first, if we uh, if we think about the symmetry, we have special rotations and special translations. And sorry, this symmetry requirement is imposed directly in the mode solution. Okay, so we 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 see here that we will have a function depending on time, and these terms that uh, these exponential terms of the momentum times the position vector, okay? So the claim of an equation now reads in the time-dependent part in this way. And here it is important to remark that we see that there is this omega term that can be intuitively seen as, a, as the uh, physical frequency of the scalar field of the modes. And this sigma term, which contains derivatives of the scale factor, can be understood as the uh, scale frequency of the space time. Okay, so the third requirement is already uh, input in the in the form of the mode, and now we we can go to the second requirement. It is that uh, any observable has to be the ultraviolet finite. Okay, and this is this is uh, done by performing an adiabatic expansion. In a cosmological scenario, in a Prima Lemaire Robertson worker space time, this can be done by performing an adiabatic expansion. So we consider a function of this type, and we say we said that locally this function has to resemble the Minkowski plus uh, other corrections due to the car background. So this W can be expanded in terms of derivatives of the scale factor. And the zero order would be, as we see, would recover just the Minkowski solution. And higher orders, for example, for the second order, we will have uh, two, deriva two derivatives of time of the scale factor. So this will include tens proportional to the scalar curvature, for example. Okay. So how we compute any observable? For example, for the two-point function, one would compute the usual two-point function. So this is uh, H squared, and now we should track the adiabatic terms up to the second order. Up to the second order, this is because the two point function is a two dimension operation, operator. Okay, for example, if we wanted to uh, regularize the stress energy tensor, which is a dimension for operator, we will have to subtract up to the fourth adiabatic order. Okay, so this is also seen. If we consider the large momentum behavior of the adiabatic expansion, we see that the divergent terms for the two point function are contained in the uh, one over k factor. We see that we have here this integral, so this will diverge quadratically, and also for one over k cube. So here, this, this one over k cube and this one will diverge logarithmically in this integral. We see that as we go higher. In the adiabatic expansion, uh, the following terms are already final. Okay. So, what has to satisfy our vacuum? That the ultraviolet divergences have to be cancelled by the large momentum behavior of the adiabatic expansion in order to have a final quantity. And this is usually stated by saying that the mode H has to be of fourth adiabatic order. So, it has to agree with the uh, adiabatic expansion up to the fourth order. This is usually called the adiabatic regularity condition. And the fourth order, it is because we usually want that the stress energy tensor has to be renormalized. So we have to go up to the fourth adiabatic order. Okay. 
So okay, we have those uh, both requirements, symmetries and ultraviolet regular behavior. So let's let's see an example of how to fix the vacuum. So now we will consider uh, this type of scale factor. Okay, it can be a, a general a general type with p bigger than one. Okay. So here we have uh, the following differential equation. And I don't want to go into the details, but you can realize that as t goes to zero, since p is bigger than one, this term will dominate over this term. So the physical frequency of the modes will dominate over the scale frequency of the space time. Therefore, this allows us to have an asymptotic form at the at t going to zero that will give us this exponential form of the Minkowski type solution. And by requiring that our analytic solution has to resemble this form of positive frequency type in Minkowski uh, solution, we, we fully determine the adiabatic vacuum state. Okay. And this adiabatic state is uh, by construction. It is renormalizable because the large uh, momentum behavior agrees with the large momentum behavior of the adiabatic expansion. So when we compute any observable and we subtract the adiabatic terms, the divergences will cancel and we get a finite observable. So this type of vacuum is renormalizable. But okay, what I told you is that we want to, to go to radiation dominated universe. And this is not the case because for that radiation dominated universe, as I told you, uh, we have here to one half. So we are in the case that P is more than one. Okay. So if we study again the, the differential equation, we see that now this term will dominate over this one. So we cannot, we don't have the asymptotic form as t goes to zero, okay? Therefore, uh, we cannot find this natural uh, vacuum. However, there is an special case that is when the, the, the scalar field is conformally massless. So it is coupled to the, to the scalar curvature with this parameter one six and the mass is zero. And in this case, for an arbitrary scale factor, we always have this type of solution. Which is the Minkowski solution. Okay. Okay. So what we do is to fix uh, our vacuum, what we, as we will see, using this condition. Because in the radiation dominated universe, we have the, the special case that the scalar curvature is zero. If one computes the scalar curvature, it depends on the first derivative of the scale factor and the second derivative of the scale factor. One can see that R is, is zero. And this allows us to, to fix the vacuum uh, as, if it, as if it were conformally coupled, okay? Because the modes behave like the conformally coupled modes. So we re-examine now the question for the radiation dominated universe. We have the following equation. And as already mentioned, if T goes to zero, we see that these terms dominate over this one. So we don't have the Minkowski type solution. However, uh, both terms, this one and this one, will dominate over the mass. So we, at early times, recover the following solution. And this is nothing that, but the massless conformally coupled uh, equation of the scalar field. Uh, scalar field must be massless and conformally coupled. And the solutions of this, of this massless conformally coupled field are those that I told you, these ones. So what we can do is to set our initial conditions uh, to be the same as the ones for uh, the positive frequency solution of a madness conformally coupled field. So that's what we do and how we fix our vacuum. And uh, I don't want to give you details because it's, you can have an analytic solution of this function in terms of with other functions. But what I want to show you is that this vacuum indeed is consistent with the normalization prescription. So now we can we compute the two point function once we have fixed the, the, the solution and we obtain this, this uh, behavior to large momentum. Okay. And we have here 
these purple terms that are indeed the same as the large behavior of the uh, adiabatic expansion. And therefore, when computing the two point, the two point function, this ultraviolet term will be canceled by the adiabatic terms of the, of the adiabatic expansion. Therefore, uh, this vacuum is a valid vacuum because it is finite. But moreover, there are some oscillating terms proportional to the mass. We see that the, the mass is what breaks this conformally, matrix conformally coupled field. But however, these oscillating terms are also finite. So we cannot, we don't have to worry about these terms. Okay. So we see that the adiabatic regularity condition is softened because we do not agree exactly with the fourth adiabatic order expansion. However, this vacuum gives us a finite observable. I'm showing here just the two-point function, the large behavior of the two-point function, but we have also checked that the stress energy tensor is also in a marathon. So in this sense, we have checked that uh, there is a natural way of finding a vacuum at early times in a radiation dominated universe, which is final when computing the two point function and the stress energy density. So, the summary is what I just said. We have studied how to define a vacuum in a radiation dominated universe by exploiting its conformal symmetry. And we have studied the renormalizability of this vacuum in full details by showing that the two point function and the stress energy tensor are both final. And we see that the adiabatic regularity conditions can be softened in some special cases. So the perspectives of future works would be to study applications to cosmology of this uh, non-adiabatic vacuum. So, for example, to consider a radiation dominated phase that went before inflation and study the evolution of this vacuum into the Vines Davis, and for example, to study the anisotropy of the CMB, something like that. Or also, there are uh, other could be other applications considering uh, non-inflationary models that consider radiation dominated phase as a initial phase of our observable universe. So it is important to know how to build the vacuum uh, in this sense at early times. And this is all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Questions. Yeah. Yes, they have one. Um, <clears throat> this parameter p that is in the power of the of the modes. Uh, what is the physical motivation? This one. Yeah, that p. If, if p is were bigger than one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because in that case, we would have the sense of singularity at every times. If p is bigger than one. Yes. Okay, but. Uh, this is like an, uh, an academic example, but the most interesting cases are P equal one half, which is radiation dominated universe. Uh, P going to infinity could be regarded as a inflationary phase, and P going to two thirds uh, is matter dominated universe, uh, I think. So, and, and your question was that. I would have a singularity when P is. I'm just considering uh, yeah. the standard solution of Frobenius uh, yeah. type equation you know, for the regular singular. When P is different from one or one half, then yeah, yeah. I'm getting trouble to find uh, solutions using Frobenius method. Yeah, you would have to be careful in that case, I mean, for sure. Uh, if P is bigger than one, you will have. Problems, yeah, because this does not satisfy the Frobenius theorem. Uh, but in in any case, you will have to study it specifically. So, yeah. Right. Any other question here? No. So, other curiosity? No. So, I guess. No, we are going to have a little break of 15 minutes, so see you soon later. The coffee break is yes, behind you. It's, you know, it's a very personal. <laughs> <laughs>
There is a micro wave here, and it is also used there. Son reciclables. Así que os animo a que le veis el vuestro y le pongáis el nombre y lo uséis de nuevo. Tengo más. Gonzalo. Se oye. Hola. Sí, sí, te escolta de. Vale, vale.
Okay, let's start again. I'm not speaker. <laughs> And going to the uh, humanities uh, with Nomi Makabi. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the work during the, the workshop and for uh, giving me the possibility of, uh, of giving this talk. So, the title of the talk is um, let's see, okay, it's Exact in the Humanities Journey with Nomi Makabi, and it's mainly based in these two works here in collaboration with Pablo Cano. From the uh, University of Boston. So let's see. Okay. So the origin of the humanity duality can be traced back to the Baptist equation of motion and the anti identity of uh, Einstein Maxwell theory. So the whole set of equations of motion of uh, Einstein Maxwell theory can be written in this way, where this would be the, the Maxwell equation. This is the, uh, the, the anti identity. Sorry, it would be the other way around. This is the Yankee entity. This is the Maxwell equation. If I write the dual field strength in terms of the original field strength, and this is the uh, Einstein equation. And it can be seen that the whole set of uh, equations of motion and the Yankee entity is uh, invariant under continuous electromagnetic duality rotations, which uh, rotate the field strength into its dual and vice versa. And uh, what is particularly interesting of electromagnetic duality. Is that it is, a, it is a symmetry of the equations of motion and not necessarily of the action itself. And this is a very particular feature of uh, electromagnetic duality. So, is everything going? Sorry. Is... No problem. No problem. Es que ahí lo hace que no. Sí, no pasa nada. Sorry, sorry por el inconveniente. Hay que empezar de nuevo, empiezo. Ok. Ok. So, yeah, I was saying that we have, in the theory, we have invariant under the equations of motion are invariant under electromagnetic torsion rotations. Which rotate the field strength into its dual and vice versa. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, this is a symmetry of the equation of motion and not necessarily of the action itself. And this is a very particular feature of duality. Okay. So, of course, apart from Einstein Maxwell theory, we know other theories which, uh, which enjoy, which have uh, exact duality variants. And perhaps one of the most famous ones is uh, Einstein born in third theory, given by. This Lagrangian here, which is uh well, which I, it is the form of this variant, it has and also it has a well-defined Maxwell well name. Apart from uh, uh may I, I'm missing myself. Okay, no, no, uh, it's okay. It's okay. So uh apart from anti body for theory, there are oh, uh, additional theories which are called invariant, for instance, Garenicki Virula electrodynamics, or the very recently discovered. Not max electrodynamics, just to say some examples. However, the previous examples are either purely electrodynamical theories with authority, just in that space, or are just minimally coupled terms, that is, uh, terms with, uh, which are just coupled with two dimensions. However, from an effective field theory perspective, if one considers an effective, uh, an effective extension of anti Maxwell theory, one should expect, wait, sorry, sorry, one should expect non non minimally coupled terms to appear, such as, let's say, these ones I'm showing here. Therefore, at this point, we may wonder, why don't we study right invariant theories with uh, non minimal couplings between the curvature and the, between the curvature and the, and the gauge field? Because, as I said, the, these kind of terms are expected to appear from an effective theory perspective, what if we consider an effective extension of Einstein Maxwell theory, and therefore it makes sense to wonder or to try to study dual invariant theories with in the presence of uh, this type of uh, terms. Perhaps one of the main, one of the main reasons uh, it hasn't been done is perhaps difficult because duality is not linearly realized, and it means that any dual invariant deformation of Einstein Maxwell theory will necessarily incorporate an infinite tower of higher degree steps. 
and this complicates the fact of uh, finding exact literary uh, invariant theory. So, uh, in this context, uh, in this works, what, what we have done, so uh, we have found the explicit form of all exactly duality invariant theories, which are quadratic on the Maxwell field experiment, and, uh, including nominal couplings between electromagnetism and, uh, and gravity. And afterwards, we proceed to the simplest exactly duality invariant theory with uh, nominal couplings. We proceed to a particular theory and uh, we study. Uh, external platform and the Arnian Horizon geometry, and we are able to obtain exactly the Arnian Horizon geometry and the entropy. Uh, well, why do we do this? Well, first of all, because it makes sense uh, to impose uh, symmetries in physics. Symmetries are uh, our uh, guiding principle in theoretical physics. Uh, symmetries allow us to, uh, uh, to restrict the type of terms we may expect uh, in the action, so it makes sense to impose. Uh, to impose symmetries and in particular a symmetry that already appears in Einstein model theory. Also, why don't we include why do we include the nominally coupled terms? Well, because we expect them from an effective theory perspective, and also as far as, far as we know, it seems it hasn't been explored in the literature. Finally, uh, we also re restrict to theories quadratic on the Maxwell field screen. I will uh, do see uh, later what do I mean by this? What I mean by this. And uh, we do this because, well, first of all, as a first step towards um, the uh, the obtention of more uh, generic, exactly, the like, variant theories. So, as a first step, we construct this type of theories, which are quadratic and multiple field strength, as a first step. But also because from a uh, from a perturbative level, if we study a perturbative expansion, uh, when we study uh, perturbative dual invariant theories. The first terms that appear in a, in a perturbative expansion with nominal copies are precisely those which are coupled to quadratic terms in the amount of field space. And therefore, from these two points of view, it makes sense to, uh, to at the very least, at, 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 at first, to restrict to theories which are quadratic on the amount of field space. So let's begin. And we, have, we shall be dealing. With uh, a general higher order theory quadratic on the Maxwell field strength, which generically has this form, I'm showing here. Okay, this is the so called susceptibility tensor, which is built out only for the metric and the curvature. So these are the kind of theories we are considering. Okay, the susceptibility tensor can be anything you may uh, think of. Of course, the form is very well, such that such that this is the form is invariant, and uh, but just built for the metric and the curvature. If we uh, introduce the dual field strength H, then the corresponding set of equations motion and Bianchi identity associated to this theory are given by these equations here. This is the Einstein equation. Okay, this is the, this is the, here I define the terms that are appearing here. Okay, this is the so called constitutive relation, which establishes the relation between the field strength and the corresponding dual. And these are the uh, Maxwell equation and the Bianchi identity. So we want uh, the set of equations of motion and the identity to be invariant under continuous electromagnetic uh, duality rotation. Okay. For that, let us take a closer look to the constitutive relation, which is the one that re relates the, the field strength uh, with its dual. For now, let us consider the very particular rotation given by pi halves, which maps. The h into minus f and h into, into h. Let us consider this rotation. If we want this rotation to be invariant under, uh, under, under continuous electromagnetic rotations, then at the very least it has to be invariant under pi halves. So let's let's see what happens if we rotate by pi halves. If we do this, if we do this, we find that the constitutive relation transforms this way. And in order for these equations to be the same, we must demand. This condition to hold. So here we find just a priori a necessary condition for duality invariance to hold in this subset of theories we are considering. So okay, we have found we have found this condition, which is a priori necessary condition. But then we may wonder: is it possible that this necessary condition is also sufficient as well? That is, at this point we just have derived a very particular condition. Derived from imposing invariance of the constitutive relation under, under the rotation by balance, 
but it may be possible that this very necessary condition turns out to be sufficient as well. And the interesting thing you know, the answer is yes, and this condition is actually a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, a theory quadratic on the Maxwell field to be exactly dual invariant. And let, let me show you a sketch of the proof. The proof is somewhat simple. First of all, we notice that the constitutive relation can be written in this manifestly dual invariant form, where this is uh, the symplectic vector and this is the symplectic matrix. Here, this equation is consistent this because the, the, the square of this matrix is minus one, and because uh, this equation holds, which basically states that the square of this tensor is minus the, the identity. So everything is consistent here. Regarding the same equation, well, it, it also remains invariant because first we notice that these two last terms can be written in a manifestly dual invariant form, and these first terms, noting that uh, this tensor also called the tropic tensor is defined in way we notice that it can be written also in a manifestly dual invariant form and consequently the answer equation remains invariant as well so the thing is the important thing to uh, to learn from here is that this is a necessary and sufficient condition for a quadratic theory which de depends uh, with, for a quadratic theory the field experiment, to be exactly relative value so what what we have to do to find all theories which are exactly the invariant with our subset theories to find all solutions to this equation. This is what we have to do. So again, I write it here again. We have to find all solutions to this equation. So let me show you how this is done. And uh, what well, we write the susceptibility tensor as a formal power series. I insist, I remark, this is not perturbative. I'm just writing this, this as a utility tensor as a form of power series controlled by certain parameters. Okay. Of course, uh, the first term of the series, I set it to be the, uh, the uh, let's say, the identity so that we recover as the macro field. And uh, when we set alpha to zero, we, 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 we want to have as the macro field. So we write the susceptibility tensor as a form of power series. Now, if we plot this, this expression for the susceptibility tensor in here, we find, uh, we find that the nth term of, the, of this series is expressed in terms of the uh, lower order of terms. So now we have to show, now we have to solve this recurrent relation. However, uh, first of all, we know this. Uh, at, at the very least, if we, if we want to have exact the variance, and we must require this perturbative invariant, invariant at the very first order. And this means that the first term of the, of the previous expansion has to have this structure I'm showing here, where this tensor is any symmetric and trace tensor being built out only from the curve. We observe that the following holds. First, uh, given this structure, we observe that this holds. Okay, fair enough. And also that the second term in the series it is constructed from this contraction of pi ones. Now, if if I denote this the n as the n coefficient of this Taylor series, which generically has this form, okay. The thing is that if we also define this uh, power of of the, the k power of uh, k one as this pairwise contraction of k ones of pi ones, sorry. Uh, then we find, first of all, the all terms of the series are identically zero, except of course, k one, and the even terms of the series are just powers of k one in this sense, powers of k one in the sense I mean, I give uh, above, just weighted by this coefficient. And with the and now the important thing this was just to explain uh, the a little bit the procedure. The important thing I want to convey to you is that. If we collect all the results above, then the uh, susceptibility tensor can be seen uh, to, to it can be summed explicitly and it has this exact form. And in particular, what I want to remark, this is the susceptibility tensor of any exactly dual invariant theory quadratic on, on F mu D. So therefore, we have solved the the condition, the necessary and sufficient condition to solve an exactly dual invariant theory. And this is the most general solution. And what we have to do is just to uh, 
to specify k1 in order to in order to particularize for the different theory we have. So this is the general form for uh, for such theory. Here I, 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 I write these theories in the form of an action, and as I said, a property choosing k1 of this form, which is we, which is required by dual invariant. Then we obtain a closed form for the action of all dual invariant theories with quadratic dependence on equilibrium. And, and since this, this is exact, this is not perturbative. And I want to say that this is very reminiscent of a uh, boring field theory since uh, this involves the square root of a certain quality. So this is something uh, nice. Now, uh, now we would like to study uh, some properties of these solutions, and, uh, sorry, some properties of these theories and in particular of their solution. Uh, in order to do that, it's uh, it's almost impossible if we if we stick uh, completely general. So what we're going to do is to uh, restrict ourselves to the simplest, exactly dual invariant theory with nominal coupling. By this, I mean choosing I one to be basically the traces of repeaters. <laughs> okay. Why? Well, first of all, uh, we can choose, uh, for instance, the instead of the trace of the tensor, we could choose uh, just to write here the stress energy tensor of uh, as the Maxwell theory. If we do that, we have Borifel theory. Therefore, Borifel theory has already been, been studied. So, therefore, let's uh, study this uh, this choice of K1, which is the easiest with nominal coupling between uh, the curvature and the field stream. It will be this story. So, therefore, we, we shall just consider this theory as an attempt to make explicit computation and try to see if we can grasp some general phenomena which are introduced by the inclusion of uh, of uh, non minimally coupled terms. Ah, restricted to this theory, we shall be interested in studying extrema black holes and their near variation geometry. So we said these extremal ansatz, okay? We said these extremal ansatz, where this would be the ADS radius, radius this would be the radius of the two sphere. Uh, and we also set this dionic configuration for the field strength. This will be the magnetic charge. And this is a quantity which will be related to the electric charge. In order to de uh, determine the near correction geometry, that is the values A, B, P, and E, well, the A, B, and, and E, sorry, and, uh, and, uh, and the entropy, we are going to resort to the sense method. This method uh, tells us that we can obtain exactly the near correction geometry. And the entropy by uh, finding the values a, b, and e that extremize the so called entropy function defined, defined this way, where this would be the electric charge, and this L would be the Lagrangian ev evaluated on this extremal ansatz. So this would be just the reduced Lagrangian on this extremal ansatz. Then, uh, if, we, if we have this entropy function, which can be easily found, if we find these values that extremal the entropy, then these extremal values uh, will yield the extremal uh, the near horizon geometry and evaluating this function on this extremal uh, on these extremizing values, then we find the entropy of, of uh, extremal black holes. So, well, first of all, uh, first we differentiate with respect to E, we find this condition. Okay, now we Substitute here. What now we now we differentiate with respect to A and B, and we find these other two conditions. We, we observe that the equations are uh, manifestly invariant under rotations of the electromagnetic charges. That is okay because we should have expected this from uh, from the invariance. And if we, uh, but the important thing about this is that we can uh, solve exactly this equation for A and B. And interestingly enough. We see that there's a unique solution for which A and B are positive, and it's given by this expression in here. The important thing about this solution is that, or one of the important things is that for this radical to be positive, we find this inequality. And this means that there exists a minimum amount of charge to produce an extremal blood. And this is an interesting behavior. Now, if we take the previous results to entropy function, we find the exact result for the, for the entropy. And we find this highly simple expression for the entropy. So in particular, we see that this is yeah, the einstein maxwell value plus a constant shift. And this is very interesting because the action contains an infinite tower of higher directive terms, although we have 
Africa, the African American part form in this uh, square root form. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, so then it contains an infinite tower of higher order pairs. But despite that, the entropy is just corrected by a constant shift. So it is the action contains an infinite tower of higher order terms, but the entropy is just corrected by a, by a single term. So this is very interesting. Also, furthermore, I want to I would like to say to remark that the this parameter is positive for uh, for uh, consist, consist, uh, consistency with the weak gravity conjecture would would require. Uh, it can be seen that uh, uh, consistency with the weak gravity conjecture requires alpha to be positive. Then the area, the entropy of the horizon varies as this uh, as this value approaches alpha, and it is a very also very intriguing behavior because uh, it is very tantalizing maybe to think that. This, this value for which the area and entropy of the horizon vanish may correspond to the elementary electric charge. Why not? But of course, this is too speculative because we can always shift the, the entropy by inclusion of topological terms and so on. But still, it's interesting to see that <laughs> if alpha is positive, but then the entropy precisely vanishes and also the area for this uh, minimum amount of charge to produce a minimum plasma. So, in conclusion, we have found the explicit form of all exactly those in banana theories, which are quadratic on the Maxwell field scale. And the susceptibility tensor, or the QRMD, these theories have this form, where we just have to specify K1 to select one of the different theories. And secondly, for external lab costs, we have encountered exactly the linear equation geometry as well as the entropy. And the entropy has this very, very simple form, which is Einstein Maxwell value plus a constant correction. Regarding the two directions, it would be nice, among other ratios, to find a closed form for exactly the invariant theories, but not necessarily quadratic or the macro field strength to, to stay a little bit more, more generous. Also, it could be interesting to study a signal black hole and the entropy for different quadratic theories. But still, if we stick ourselves <laughs> to this uh, very particular theory, we may wonder why was the correction to entropy so simple? Was it due to that invariance? In case it was due to that invariance, could we derive, could we derive a proof of it? And even sticking to this particular theory, uh, could we be able to find exact static, static and static asymmetric solutions, uh, non extremal solutions? Could they be regular? Could this be connected to duality? These are some questions which I would like to address in the, in the field. So, thank you. I'll see any questions, any here? Just a curiosity. Uh, so you computed the entropy with this sense yeah. method, which I don't know. But uh, my question is if, is, if you try to compute the entropy with other methods like Wald's entropy formula. No, uh, oh, okay. Uh, and yes, uh, integral methods. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, sense method is just, uh, is just uh, a, particular, uh, a particular method to, uh, it, it is based on wall entropy on, on wall entropy method, but, but it involves for the computation of uh, the entropy of external black holes. It just uh, send proof that uh, if we have uh, uh, if we consider near correlation geometries of external black holes, instead of computing the, the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the Riemann tensor, what you can do is to uh, evaluate directly the, the Lagrangian on the near correlation geometry and then differentiate with respect to. To three parameters, which of course you prefer to differentiate with respect to three parameters rather than differentiating with respect to a Riemann tensor. So this is Wolf's entropy method. Yeah, 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 no, it, it just uh, Wolf's entropy method Where applied for the Riemann tensor. That's it. It's, it's nothing that's very clear. Okay, uh, maybe already okay, I didn't understand what you meant, but in which sense you are dealing with high order correction when you just put the quadratic term? No, of course, uh, of course. Uh, let's say. Uh, I, I don't know if this is it, but uh, I mean, I don't know if this is it. Uh, what? Yeah, 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 that's right. right. That's I, right. I, I don't know. You're going, you're going to go here and think about things. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. So, so this is a fair uh, and this And this thing is coupled to. 
Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course, yes. So, so it is quality, but this can be any crazy thing. Uh, uh, R227 or whatever. I would think about like Ordensky modification in the potential of the to make him back to the Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'm referring to this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, well, we have stuck to this, uh, to this series, but first of all, because uh, let's try the very first we'll study the, the, this series. Because uh, we noticed that uh, non nominal couplings, which are this, this type of couplings between the brother and the gauge field, uh, have not been considered in the, in the realm of duality uh, invariant, so to say. And also because at the very perturbative level, and when, when you say perturbative, uh, when you say at the perturbative level, duality invariant theory, then you find then you find at the at the perturbative level and for the, at the fourth level, level uh, you find that the you have two possible uh, theory, two possible terms that respect to the invariance at the fourth level. And these are well, trivially uh, 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 Maxwell stress energy tensor contracted with itself and, and Ricci tensor con con contracted with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Maxwell stress energy tensor. And therefore, since this term is quadratic, uh, this is quadratic on the Maxwell flip term, I remember. This is this is the final way. Uh, why? Why? I, I, I think. Ah, yes, it's, 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 So yes. So that's why at the at the level, the first nominal couple terms are already of this kind. Therefore, why not? Okay. Any other question? <laughs> So, the main object of uh, this talk is the subjectivity tensor, no? And it is uh, an object that arises typically when you deal with uh, uh, electromagnetism uh, in, in, in matter. Subjectivity no? is precisely the, the object that uh, um, quantifies the strength of the polarization with respect to an external field, no? In this work, you have no uh, propagation in matter, you're, huh. you're not dealing with this. Uh, subject, no? But what is the physical meaning of the subjectivity tensor in this case? Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we, we're just calling it a uh, subjectivity tensor. Uh, you could take it as a, as a definition, just to name the chi tensor as a different way. Instead of saying chi, we say subjectivity tensor. If you are asking me for the uh, very precise meaning of susceptibility of the susceptibility tensor, uh, I can't tell you at this moment the, the physical meaning. I, I should have to, I, I should have to take a look at the uh, when we uh, when we to couple the different kind of matter to see how, how it couples, but at the very uh, at this moment we just call chi susceptibility tensor just to to give it a different name instead of a letter. Your scheme is the the, the, the constant of proportionality between the, the strength tensor, the gauge strength tensor, and its dual. Yes, yes, that's it. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. In the, in the, yes, okay. in the, the Marshall theory would be one. Yes, that's it. In the exactly this, this is this is what, what you said exactly in the constitutive relation which relates the dual field strength h with f it's just this this tensor yes yeah, exactly thank you yes. so it would be nice to implement this kind of setting in a theory in which you look at a matter content in order to yes. to be able to specify a specific form for that kind of dielectric yeah it, uh, yeah for instance yes yes uh, it could be nice uh, because here we're still completely general but why not considering a particular exercise of of susceptibility that it was susceptibility that's what yeah it could be nice this was just general to see the the structure the aspect of and uh, the invariant theories but then here I, I here we show some results regarding a very particular theory but of course there are infinitely many so yes, of course, it would be nice to to characterize for so particular theory. Thank you. Nice okay. time, by the way. Ah, thank you. Thank you again. So now we have an online presentation. Anita, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. We cannot see. Uh, yes, because my camera doesn't work, sorry.
Yes, I would like to share. Hmm. Right. Can you see the slides? Not yet. Okay. But you can see your you, you can see your screen. So, that mm -hmm. so this is a bit so okay, so now you should see it, right? Yeah, now it's working. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from this present old presentation, I would just like to show you two slides before I will go to some papers. Uh, so I was told that this is a workshop, so I need to prepare like a proper presentation. So today I would like to show you um, some ideas I have about how to uh, test uh, modified gravity theories uh, with the use of exoplanets. But firstly, let, we, let us discuss if we really can do that. So uh, you can ask like I mean, for the motivation uh, why we mix these two notions, no? like the modified gravity and substellar objects. So there are already a number of paper uh, in which you can uh, you can find that really modified gravity theory. Here we mainly discuss uh, Palatini like gravities, but modified gravity affects especially gravitational physics of non-relativistic objects. If you are interested in more details, you can uh, see the review or some papers. Uh, not only on Palatini, but also other fields of gravity. Uh, I also believe that uh, because we understand the physics of uh, low mass stars, of the sun, also of the planets, a bit better than the physics of neutron stars and black holes. So maybe this will give us a possibility to understand effects of gravity a bit better. Uh, than when we think about uh, early universe or those compact objects. Also, uh, so, so as I mentioned, uh, we understand the physics in stars in giant planets a bit better. I'm not saying that there are no problems, which we, I mean, some, some issues which we don't understand yet, which we don't know how to, how to solve, for example, about the equation of state for hydrogen. But when you want to study this, uh, those objects, uh, you need to take into account all four interactions. So all those four interactions are there. Uh, they are like mixing together when you, I know, calculate something, uh, some nuclear reactions and so on. So we need to take into account the nuclear physics, particle physics, and also gravity because it has a lot of to say uh, in, in such a situation. And as I said, we understand the, uh, the physics in those regimes of temperatures and pressure a bit better than in the case of neutron stars, for example. And so far, the the main idea, the main like um, issue I, I, I found regarding uh, modified gravity and those on those objects is that we understand. Uh, I mean, what we see. I mean, the biggest difference with respect to the Newtonian physics or general relativity is related to the age of uh, of particular objects. So, for example, there are uh, some white walls which seems to be older than the universe when they are described in, uh, in Newtonian physics or in general relativity. But when you take into account general relativity, some phases of the stellar evolution are much shorter uh, than uh, the ones provided by Newtonian physics. I will not talk here about that. I will just show you uh, how this is related with uh, Jupiter-like planet, for example. Uh, so also this finding has uh, uh, quite important um, thing related to the formation of the solar system because if um, a planet such as Jupiter, uh, evolution of such a planet is a bit uh, different than in a common accepted model like Newtonian gravity because in solar system when we consider planets we use uh, Newtonian physics. So if uh, if Newtonian physics which, which we use for describing non-relativistic uh, objects so uh, the, the, the stars like the sun or planets, if we have like very, very slight difference, so maybe the, the physical properties like uh, temperatures, internal structure and so on are not so significant different from internal physics. However, in the age we see, uh, I mean, in the whole evolution 
the the time a given object needs to evo evaluate from one point of the evolution to another is quite uh, significant, as you can see on, on some picture. And also, a modified gravity really affects some age determination techniques, which are related to the lithium methods. Here, I will not talk about that. If you are interested, you can have a look uh, in those papers. Moreover, another motivation is that really pretty soon, in four years from now or a bit longer, uh, we will have really, really a lot of data with uh, better accuracy than, than now from many missions uh, from NASA and ESA. So also having models in different fields of gravity which describe those objects, uh, so we will, we will be able to do the statistics using those data and uh, constrain fields of gravity or test those fields. But this is uh, this uh, this is already we are we are preparing the model. Uh, I am collaborating with people who know how to deal with the, with such a data, how to do the statistics. So, in a few years, I hope uh, on another workshop I will be able to show you uh, some results regarding uh, regarding this problem. So, uh, so this is like the main, the main motivation. So let me just repeat that modify gravity. Not all fields of gravity, but like the most popular, metric affine, uh, scalar, tensor, theories, they modify uh, non-relativistic uh, physics. So, uh, just another uh, motivation, because here I am, I am using the word low mass objects, so by this I mean low mass stars like the sun, or smaller stars, ground wars, and also the planets. So the planets, so we can divide planets into terrestrial planets like the Earth, Mars, Venus, uh, and also into uh, giant gaseous planets so like Jupiter, Saturn, for example. And most of the exoplanets we have now are Jupiter-like planets. So there are gaseous uh, giants, which is not very weird because they are huge. Uh, so they are much easier to detect than the the terrestrial planets. However, we can, we can also have, I mean, we already we have quite a lot uh, terrestrial planets. And most of them are related to the Kepler missions. And here on that picture, uh, just for curiosity, I am showing you some another system with a low mass star. So that star is uh, smaller than, uh, than our sun. So there is a planet of a very similar size and very similar properties which is in the so-called habitable zone. So maybe on that planet, because it's very similar, it is in the habitable zone, so the tidal forces and the star's properties are in such a way that maybe, maybe here on that, on that planet there is under light, like on the Earth. But, as I mentioned, uh, modified gravity modifies uh, such stars, I mean the, the internal properties, so also, because in order to get the idea if this region is habitable or not, you need to know the properties of, of, of your star. And also the properties of the, of the planet also depend on modified gravity. So here I wrote a, a few notes. Uh, there are already tests uh, of, uh, of standard model of particle physics, of dark matter, uh, uh, with the use of low mass uh, stars and brown dwarfs. Uh, and also there are more and more papers regarding uh, fields of gravity, which we can also uh, use uh, those, uh, I mean, those objects to test fields of gravity. So I've already done uh, this talk many times. Uh, so this time I just wanted to focus on uh, exoplanets. So let me... Uh, this will be a bit complicated because I need to share again another paper. So, yes. So, is it big enough that you can see? Okay, now I think it should be better, but I don't see it very well. Okay, so firstly, uh, I would like to talk about a Jupiter like planets, so Javad planets. Especially that we have already quite big statistics, and uh, soon we will have a uh, much bigger data set regarding those objects with uh, big, uh, with uh, good accuracy. So, 
Uh, here in that, in that paper, like the most important thing I would like to show is that cooling time, cooling time of Javan planets is different in modified gravity. So it means that we have the, the evolution of such an object is a bit different. So uh, in that paper, as, uh, as an example, I'm using uh, Jupiter, the Sun system. So the Jupiter Sun distance, the mass of Jupiter, uh, mass of the Sun, and so on. So, so those properties. So, let me jump to the to the modeling of those objects. So, firstly, we need to generally we need to consider like three different uh, regions of, of the of the planet. So, firstly, and this is the most tricky uh, tricky part. So the how to model atmos atmosphere of a planet or generally also in a, uh, of the star, well, it is uh, it is difficult because uh, it, it depends on um, quite many assumptions, and because here I am doing mainly analytical uh, work, so I'm not using any, any program and simulations and the numerics. So so of course I'm using some uh, approximated uh, analytical. Uh, values of formulas, but those things are not related to the to the gravitational part of our equations. So generally, we should have the same effect if we improve this kind of description. So I am working a bit now uh, on that one, but because I'm not a specialist on the opacity, uh, opacity tells you how opaque the matter is for the electromagnetic radiation. And this is really very important when you want to model an object like a star or a planet. So, so this is like the weak point uh, of like any of those uh, of those works I am showing you. So, as I say, there is quite uh, many simplification related to description of the atmosphere. So, generally, when we consider um, a planet, so we need to take into account uh, also the energy source which is given by the parent star. So we have a contracting, uh, contracting planet. I'm not here talking about the early evolution. I mean, I discussed some early evolution, so how it, uh, about the formation, also I'm working now about the formation of the, of such a planet, but here let, let's, uh, let's say that we have already a well-formed planet, but it still contracts, no? So also Jupiter, here in our solar system, our Javan planets are also still contracting, so the, the, that evolution is not done yet. So, so the star is sorry. So the planet is contracting. So there is the energy uh, release related to the uh, to that gravitational contraction, which is radiated away from the atmosphere. So this is why the atmosphere is important here. However, as I mentioned, there is also the energy source, which is uh, the sun. So in that model, I assume that only we have these two sources of the energy from the from the gravitational contraction and from the sun. There are also the Ohmi heating, tidal forces, also the influence of the moons is quite important in that modeling. But here I don't, I mean, uh, let's forget it for now. So, uh, generally there is, uh, there is a notion which is called the uh, thermal equilibrium. So this is the effective temperature when the star already finished contraction. So we can say this equilibrium temperature is a temperature which, uh, I mean, when you have the energy from the sun and it radiates away the, the energy which it uh, absorbs. But because the, the, the planet is still contracting, there's another source. So the equilibrium temperature is not equal to the effective temperature. So we need to find this, I mean, this relation. And this can be done by this Edicton, Edicton's uh, approximation. I will, not, I will not go into the details. But at the end, we can have such a, uh, such an equation. So this is the equation number one, which we need, uh, which we need for for our modeling. Then, uh, having this, we can calculate the uh, the pressure in the atmosphere. So using uh, yeah, some very simple opacity model, uh, we can calculate what is the pressure in the atmosphere. So you see, it depends on those on those temperatures from this uh, from the previous equation. So we have, let's say, for now the atmospheric values. And then the important, uh, another important region is the so-called boundary between the atmosphere and the interior. Um, the interior of the, 
uh, of Jupiter-like planets can be considered as a fully convective, so it means that we can use polytropic equation of state, which is nice because it's anal analytical, we can do a lot of calculations, and the atmosphere is radiative. And there is a condition which tells you when you can switch one of kind of energy transport, like convective one, into the radiative one. It, it turns out that it also depends on the theory of gravity, but uh, this was shown in another paper. So here we need the, the boundary uh, between these two. So we need to get, we need to have the temperature and uh, and um, and pressure uh, on that boundary, and this can be done uh, with the use of the so-called uh, critical depth. Uh, which you calculate from optical depth. So I don't want to go into into details in order not to make you sleepy, but generally we can we can get those um, those two equations. Just let me notice. Let me say that this u and w this is related to the opacity model. So this is already quite as you see. I mean this is really important. This opacity science, which I don't know very well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I mean, I am using the approximation, which is good for uh, like a simple planet. But uh, if I want to improve that description, I should take care more about those those things here. So this uh, boundary, uh, boundary pressure and boundary uh, temperature depends on the model of gravity. So here I am using Palatini a quadratic model, and my parameter is alpha and delta, which is related to alpha. No details about that, how and so on. If you are interested, you can discuss later. You can write me, uh, and so on. So, so you see that here we have the modification. And then we need to we need to uh, derive the uh, those values for the for the interior. So here I assume a simple mixture. Uh, mixture so we have the ideal gas and uh, 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 and the uh, polytropic equation of state. So. So playing with those equations which we derive, we can write such an equation. So here inside uh, we have the effective temperature, which you don't see, but it's there. So the, how the effective temperature is related to the internal, uh, some internal observational stuff of the of your planet, because this is the mass of the of the planet and the radius, and of course everywhere is opacity by this U and W. Again, we see that the, it depends on the model. Uh, on the model of gravity. And when we, okay, so we are not solving yet this. And then finally, if we want to have the evolution, so we can study the energy equation. So we have the luminosity. So the absorbed luminosity from the, from the source as the, the sun is, and the gravitational contraction. So when we take all those equations I derived uh, before into account, at the end, we can write the evolutionary equation, which is, which again depends on the uh, on modified gravity. And I can solve those three equations. This one, the one which uh, relates the effective temperature with the radius, uh, and this equation, so I can solve that equation, and to draw this uh, herbs roof russell diagram uh, for a giant planet. So here I consider Jupiter. And you can see that Firstly, the evolutionary paths are different. So maybe in the in the temperature and in the in the luminosity, there will not be very big difference uh, because here I assume also that okay, I have a lot of simplification. So when I consider a realistic model, the situation can be can be either I mean the difference can be even smaller than between these two curves, but there is quite significant difference in the uh, in the time, in the age of the planet. So uh, let me show you here a table. So as you see, uh, so this is for alpha equal, like in all those two values. So generally, effective temperature and luminosity are not very different for, uh, I mean, between modified gravity and um, and linear physics. But here I calculated the 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 age. So you can see. That especially in the late uh, evolution, the somehow this uh, this time accelerates. I mean, the age accelerates, so it can happen that your uh, that our Jupiter is I don't know twice 
uh, younger or older. So, uh, so this is the situation, and it gives us, uh, I mean, the question which ap appears immediately. So, because the the way how we model uh, solar system, our solar system, really depends on the physics and on the formation of of uh, Jupiter. So, if we believe that there is another fear of gravity, I'm not claiming here that this is Palatini gravity, but if there is any fear of gravity which describes uh, the whole universe, everything that we would like to have, and describes a bit better than, um, than general relativity, then that theory modifies even slightly the Newtonian physics, the, our knowledge about the solar system, solar system formation, uh, is different than the one we believe. There are many problems related to the formation of the solar system. I will not discuss them here. Uh, so, but this is like the the, the first step uh, here for for the works uh, regarding German exoplanets. And uh, soon there will be something more. Uh, I hope. So may, maybe let uh, let me allow to uh, to jump to another. Um, another paper. Yes, you should see this one. Let me make it bigger. So, this uh, paper regards uh, terrestrial planets, so not only the exoplanets, but also the Earth, as you will see. And here we are uh, giving the idea that uh, using Earthquakes. I mean, data from the seismic data from the earthquakes and Mars quakes. Maybe not now, because maybe our instruments are not uh, are not good enough. But uh, I will show you that maybe in ten or a bit more years there will be uh, a bit better. So, using those data, we will be able to test theories of gravity. But again, theories of gravity which slightly modify Newtonian physics. So, let me just show you the. Uh, the main results, but to do that, I need to show you another picture, from another paper. So this is what I don't like about this big button that I cannot just share. Uh -huh. Okay, now if I do this, can you see? What I am showing. Can you see that paper, this metric affine gravity? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Ah, great. Okay, so it will be much easier for me. Uh, so let's jump here to that paper. So this is this is very important paper. Uh, with a very, very important tool. So mass radius relation for solid exoplanets. So, and this is the picture I would like to show you from the paper. So, uh, so here they, they are, I mean, they are using Newtonian equations, Newtonian hydrostatic equilibrium equation. They have very well tested equation of states from, for the, uh, for the light elements, not, but for the heavier elements, yes. So they have very good equation of state, very well tested. Uh, for those uh, for those uh, materials, so for the iron, uh, some silicate, some mixtures, and so on. So, as you can see, uh, we can draw this this picture with those lines, with those those curves, and each material has a particular curve. You no, know? so here they are in colors, and this is a very nice picture and a very very good tool. Something which people studying exoplanets are using often. So, for example, you know when I was showing you at the very beginning the this Kepler planet, uh, and there was a claim that this planet is like the Earth. So, how they know that this is that this is like the Earth-like planet? I mean, using this picture, and of course later on, if they know there is a planet, they uh, they aim more uh, telescopes there. They get more data. Also, data about uh, from the from the sun, from the metallicity of the sun. So they have more or less the idea what is the what are the main elements of the uh, of this uh, of the solar system, the Kepler system. But this is like the the, the first uh, idea, uh, the, the first idea you can get about the type of the planet you have. So so we know that we have those curves, and each curve is for each different material, for mixtures and so on. 
And here you have some planets, so they are the solar system planets, and those uh, are some exoplanets with some uh, Eros bars. So those two planets, yeah, the bigger one is the Earth, this is Mars, uh, or Venus, sorry, Mars, Mercury is not visible here, uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune, uh, Saturn and Jupiter. So you see, for example, Jupiter is on the helium or the mixture of the helium and hydrogen curve. The Earth and uh, Venus are very similar and they're on the silicon curves and so on. So if I have some exoplanet, so for example this one, so I know that this exoplanet is very similar to, the, to Neptune and Uranus. Those are very similar to Jupiter and so on. So this is this is like really very important tool. There are the this, this paper is from uh, 2007, I think. So there are the uh, this picture is also improved a bit. But what I demonst demonstrate with my colleague, those picture when you use some modified gravity here again, Palatini quadratic model with the parameter alpha. So those pictures uh, can be different. So here there is just silicate. So the planet here we model is made of only one uh, material. So here silicate, uh, here you have water, um, iron. So you see that especially for bigger planets, because like for Mercury or here for, the, for Mars and the Earth, we don't see a really big difference, but please have a look on those density profiles and you see that there is quite big difference especially for the iron because uh, in terrestrial planet the iron is the, the material which the core is made of so there is quite a big difference in the density profile so we know okay i know that this is only a toy model the planet made of just one material but here we, we proposed a test of gravity with using the seismology because, because we know that there is one planet and soon there will, be, there will be two planets that we know the composition uh, and, and also the structure of the planet we know very well and this is the Earth. And this, uh, this is the picture from the so-called preliminary reference Earth model. So this model has seven layers. So here you have the core, the iron core, and here there are some silicates and some mixture of silicates and something else. So this is the, the density profile, how the density changes with respect to the radius. So this is the picture. In another paper, we already improved the previous, uh, the previous modeling. So we have two layers. So you see that again in modified gravity, so that he has this prem model, let's say, for alpha equals zero. So you see that we, we can have different uh, core values and also the boundaries. So when the core finish and the mantle, uh, and the mantle uh, begins can be also different. And this fact has uh, a big influence on the polar moment of inertia. So when we know the density profile, we can calculate the, this model of inertia and compare it with the observational one. So this is uh, so this is the precession rate, which is caused by the gravitational tokens from the sun. All those quantities, yeah, you can read more details. I don't have time now, but uh, all those quantities are very well. I mean the, the accuracy of those of those uh, values is very very good in the case of the solar system planets, so especially for the Earth and for the Mars. Uh, on the Mars, we have already the seismometer, so soon we will have also data about the internal structure of the Mars. So we will have another planet to uh, to study. So because in modified gravity we have we can have different uh, different profiles. So this will have an effect of the, on, the, on this one, and we can compare it with the, uh, with the observational data. So this is uh, like the first idea. And uh, yeah, and because uh, so maybe I will finish now, I have something more, but uh, now I see that I am lacking of the time. So do not let me repeat. We know very well 
And this this uh, pram model is from 80s, so now it's like 40 years more. We have more information. And let me just, because you, you can ask the question, okay, but those uh, alphas are very small, so maybe this effect will be hidden in the in the errors. We will not be able to constrain theorems of gravity. And we are pretty right. But we are still improving first with this prem model. So we know better and better what is happening in different uh, zones, in different regions of the Earth. Still, there are a lot of uh, things we don't understand, but we understand better. For example, recently in this, in this year, so this is a very interesting paper, and so the, the, the seismic, of, seismic uh, instruments are also getting better. So uh, this, um, this experiment revealed that the core of the planet, uh, of the inner core, is liquid or mushy. But bef uh, before that, we, ha we had been believing that this is uh, solid. Another thing that something like 10 years from now, there will be a new generation of the neutrinos telescopes. And those telescopes, uh, those you neutrinos know, data and so on, will help us to understand what is real, real in reality, the matter density, because from the prem model, you need you assume Newtonian physics. So, when you look at the prem model, you have the densities of each zone, and those densities are model dependent. Here, this very likely it will not be the case, and also we will get more accurate uh, data about the abundances and characteristic of light elements of the outer core. So, we will have more information about the core because the um, uh, the mantle and the um, more outside regions are better understood. And also in the laboratories, and this is quite important, also in laboratories now we are able to uh, we are we are able to recreate the extreme condition of the Earth's core, so the temperature and uh, uh, and pressures. And people are understanding how iron is behaving in those temperatures and regions. So it means that soon we will also have a better equation of state for the iron in those uh, in those uh, pressure regimes. So, so I'm not saying that now we will be able, like, really to test uh, and constrain laws of gravity, but very soon when we really know what what is the equation of state of this inner core, which is like the big uh, question mark here. Uh, for, for the Earth. Also, we will understand better a bit the, those, uh, those boundary. We will be able to constrain the fields of gravity because, as you see, there is really a difference in, uh, in the city profiles. Uh, yeah, so, th so this is what I wanted to uh, show you today. Um, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, Aneta. Um, I have some questions. I, I, I didn't understand well how uh, 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 the Palatini gravity affects the, the matter density because it's, it's surprising how uh, such a small parameter affects in a so huge way to, to the density and the and the time expectancy and formation of, of uh, those systems. So I don't know if you can go deeper in, in, with that. Yes. So, okay, so here there's like the standard stuff on Palatini gravity. And generally, this kind of behavior of the mass radius relation for the terrestrial planets. Uh, and the internal structure and so on, we will have in any theories of gravity which uh, modifies the internal limit. So you have modified gravity, and then you need to have the, this equilibrium, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium equation. So, okay, here we wrote it with respect to some something which is called invariance, but this is calculated for modified gravity. So this is like a general equation. So there, are, there is some modification which is hidden in this I1 and y I2, okay? So maybe I can, sh also the mass is a bit, oh, here. Uh, so, so this is, this is the, for, uh, already for the 
um, for a particular uh, equation of state describing different uh, materials we were discussing. So we have this hydrostatic equilibrium equation. So it's quite ugly. And the modification comes from uh, alpha here. So when you put alpha, you have Newton and gravity. And here we can have we have a non-relativistic limit. So when we don't take into account uh, pressure and relativistic effect here, like related to the to the geometry. Let me just mention that here my planet is spherical symmetric, not rotating, and so on. So in the future work, we are going to take into account uh, the the flatness of the uh, of the poles of the planet, also that it rotates and so on. So this equation will, will be much more uh, complicated. So this is this is the equation. And alpha, uh, but, uh, because alpha, it's not the, the parameter, oh, exactly. So this is how I define alpha. So beta is the Starobinsky parameter. Oh, here you have the model. So beta is, is the Starobinsky parameter. It's around like 10 to 12, 20 to 13 centimeters square. So this is okay, like from uh, other tests. So just uh, because it's easier to, to write our equation, we use alpha, which is defined uh, in this way. You know? So this is why alpha is so small, uh, because of this kappa here. So, yeah, so even, even, the, even if we, in this, this mass radius equation, we don't see for the Earth, for example, uh, as I showed you in the picture, we don't see a really a big difference. Let's go to the Earth. So this is a uh, homogeneous planet, so uh, this is silicate, Earth is here, so okay, you see some small difference, but uh, I mean with the some errors in the radius and mass, maybe it's not visible, but there's already a difference in the, in the density profile. And now when we have like two layer uh, planet with the core and the mantle, the difference is a bit bigger here and here, as I saw you on some other picture. Uh, and now we are going to uh, prepare uh, like a really realistic model, taking into account the seismic data. Then we will add uh, rotation and uh, this, the, the, uh, the, the planet is not spherical symmetric and so on. So this is ongoing work and there's a lot of to do. But yeah, we were also surprised that there is such a big difference in this, uh, in this thing. So maybe very quickly I will show you another paper. Uh, when we are studying uh, how to, I mean, there are approximation uh, things. So this is 99 on this paper. So here we're studying like interior, uh, interiors of terrestrial planets or exoplanets. So there is also a tool how to get the idea about the composition of the exoplanets when you only have a radius and the mass of the planet. So, but this is a very approximate idea, but it works quite well, like 20%, it's okay with the, I mean, with other data. So, so using this formalities, which I'm not going to discuss, but let just let show me uh, what we got. So for example, the pressure in the mantle, it's here we have Starbinsky parameter beta, okay? so. This is how we, this is the modification. And everything here we wanted to write with respect to the mass and the radius because the, there are the two observables we have about a given planet, exoplanet. The pressure on the uh, core uh, mantle bandar is also, again, is also modified. And the pressure in the core, again, is modified and even the, the modification is much more complicated. And the difference is really quite big uh, in the core, but in the mantle, we don't really see, because we have more pictures, we don't see a uh, very big difference. No, but this is not, not weird, because this modification is really very small in the mantle, but in the core, we are dealing with really quite big difference. And, okay, and uh, because, uh, so measurements uh, on the density of the core of the Earth would uh, lead us to some uh, bounds to theories in the, this part in the theories? Mm, uh, rather not because, okay, because the what we know about now the interior, I mean, the, uh, uh, about the properties of the core, like pressure or density. So we have seismic data, 
and from this seismic data and Newtonian equations, we get the the pressure or the or the density of the, of the core. So this is a model dependent thing. But what we have from the pre model, from the pre model, we have the boundaries. So we know when there is a big drop uh, between one layer and another one, like this. So what we know well is the boundary, okay? And we see that also the boundary depends on the model of gravity. So what I wanted to do is I want to uh, create, I mean, do the model of an Earth with seven layers, about this, with the boundaries which are, I mean, we will put it as a condition, do we need to have such a boundaries? And because of those boundaries, we likely will be able to say something about the parameter alpha, not to, to constrain the alpha. Okay, Aneta, just uh, curiosity. I was wondering mm -hmm. whether you are taking into account the effects on modified gravity also in the radiation emitted from the star. Okay, okay. So, uh, could you repeat? Or maybe you can, because I know if you are in the room, I don't hear you well. Okay. So if you have taken into account the effects of the modified gravity also in, in radiation emitted from the, from the star, by the star. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so for now, no, because this is, uh, yeah, this is difficult because you need to really take into account a lot of things. And for this, I need to have already uh, some tools like MESA, for example, or some other codes uh, which take into account a lot of things. So for now, I am dealing with just single systems, so I am studying a star or a planet. Uh, okay, with Jupiter and generally with, with the evolution of a planet, you need to take into account uh, uh, the star, so the, the parent star. But like uh, here, I'm not taking into account it yet. But maybe in the future, when I learn more tools uh, related to modeling, uh, yes, I hope, uh, yes, but it should be taken into account because also the, the physics of the sun will be different in modified gravity, a bit. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. Now we proceed with the last talk of this morning session. Do you remember what I you Thank you, Okay. We got it, we got it. We had a lot of trouble, but we, we fixed it. So. Hey. Sorry, share the screen.
Okay, now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, our last speaker today is uh, Dimitrios Kanas from this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me this nice opportunity to uh, talk to you today here, this nice workshop. And I'm also very glad that I will be spending the next semester here in Valencia working uh, among you. So uh, this is a work that I have been doing here at uh, Louisiana State University, working with my advisor, Rimas Bullo, and, uh, and another graduate student who actually now has graduated, is a postdoc at the Arizona University, under the Gadi. And this is a work uh, lying at the intersection of uh, quantum field theory in gap space science, uh, optics, and uh, quantum information theory. So hopefully by the end of the talk, I will convince you that uh, all these seemingly unrelated fields have a common denominator, which is the, the, the Hawking effect. Okay, so I will start with a little bit of uh, you know historic uh, uh, motivation. So, so as you know, you know in 1974, Stephen Hawking astonished the scientific community by showing theoretically that uh, when one takes into account uh, the quantum effects of uh, of, uh, of matter of the scalar field, propagating uh, Close the black hole, the black hole space time. He, he showed that the black holes emit a thermal type of radiation, which is of quantum origin. And this is called the Hodging effect. And if I have to uh, you know, tell you what the Hodging effect is, is in one sentence, in one line, I would say that it is the creation of a dangled pairs of particles uh, by a black hole, by black hole event horizons. So the usual uh, narrative goes as follows. So the main ingredient for the Hawking effect is a black hole and the quantum field. But as we know, in a quantum theory, vacuum is not empty, but rather consists of energy fluctuations, which can be interpreted as a creation and annihilation of pairs of particles. But when that takes place to the vicinity of the event horizon, one of them may end up falling inside, and the other, due to the moment when the pressure will go to the asymptotic region, far away. And the flux of these outgoing particles uh, makes what we know as the Hawking radiation. This is a very specific type of radiation in the sense that it is a, follows a black body spectrum, and therefore the full radiation is fully characterized by a single parameter, which is the Hawking temperature, and depends only on the black hole mass. But you know, the interesting thing in that expression here to me is the constants. We see we have four fundamental constants of nature, which to me shows that. This is the richest, and if not the richest, is one of the richest processes in nature. Uh, as I said, this is a process of quantum origin, and therefore it must carry a quantum signature, which is the entanglement shared between the outgoing flux and the incoming uh, flux of particles. Um, all of this, uh, this is a very nice uh, theoretical uh, calculation. Unfortunately, it hasn't been observed so far, and uh, due to uh, very high typical black hole masses. Uh, it is accepted that this radiation will be, never be able to be observed by typical black holes. And the reason is that for typical black holes, the Hawking uh, temperature is going to be very low, which is, you know, the resulting radiation is going to be buried even by the cosmic microwave background. So that would be the end of the story that, you know, we have very nice uh, theoretical calculation, but we cannot observe it. But uh, fortunately, this is not the end of the story. Thanks to another brilliant physicist, uh, seven years later after uh, Hawking's calculation, Unruh showed that in this seminal paper, he showed that uh, uh, fields propagating in a moving dispersive medium, they follow uh, identical equations of motion to those fields, you know, uh, propagating in the black hole space time. So essentially, you know, to put it in, into perspective, uh, a field propagating in this dispersive medium could not say the difference if this is a moving medium or if it is a black hole space time. So you can, we can use this nice mathematical analogy to study, to reproduce kinematical effects of black holes to, to the laboratory. So essentially, UNRU created a new field called analog gravity models, where we can essentially reproduce the causal structure of a black hole to laboratory settings. So, uh, since then, a lot of effort has been put into, into uh, pushing further these analogies, uh, a lot of you know, theoretical and experimental works. And 
I would say that, you know, essentially they fall in these three categories. We have the hydrodynamic analogs, where essentially we study propagation of sound waves in moving media. We have both Einstein analogs and we also have optical analogs. Uh, this is where I work uh, uh, and I will be talking about today. So now let me tell you how we can make an optical uh, black hole in the laboratory. So the recipe is as follows. The ingredients is a dielectric medium, for example, a fiber, optical fiber or a crystal. Uh, we need a, a strong electromagnetic pulse, also called the pump. And we also need a weak electromagnetic pulse, also called the probe or a test field. And the mechanism of interest is called the Kerr effect, which is the nonlinear interaction between the strong electromagnetic pulse with the medium. The result of this nonlinear interaction is the modification to the index of refraction by a local term that depends on the, on the position of the strong pulse. So to show you this uh, schematically, let's see the following picture. Imagine that here we are placed inside the dielectric medium and from left to right, we have the direction of propagation. So if it, this is a fiber, uh, the direction of propagation is the horizontal axis. So uh, this Gaussian like set in the middle, that is the strong electromagnetic pulse. And by strong, I mean, it has a very high intensity. So because of the high intensity, the index of refraction changes around this strong pulse. So we have a constant value far away from the strong pulse, but once we approach, the index of refraction increases. So this guy moves with a velocity u to the right. And imagine now that we send test fields from the area path, for example. If, the group, if we tune the field such that initially moves faster than strong pulse, because it moves faster, it will be able to start approaching and eventually catch up with him. But once it gets closer, it experiences a higher index of refraction, and as a result, it slows down. Now, if the intensity of the strong pulse is high enough, uh, that guy will slow down a lot, and in principle, it will match uh, this, this group velocity will be equal to that. And for example, let's say that this happens in this location. So that location will be like a blocking barrier because this wave will not be able to go any, any further beyond that location and go to the interior of the strong pulse. So that mimics here, what I, what I just described, mimics a white hole uh, causal structure because here we have signals that they can propagate in either way, but, uh, but uh, you know, no signal here can enter beyond that point. So that, that, that mimics a white hole. The opposite happens to the front part. So the front part behaves like a black hole because here uh, we have waves propagating in another direction, but if we are asymptotic observers and we find uh, some waves, we know that those waves can only emerge from here because in that region, if there is a physical process creating that wave, uh, that wave would, be, would move slower than the strong pulse, and therefore it, it wouldn't be able to overtake, to go beyond that point. So to summarize this picture, we have three regions, region one, two, and three. In region one and three, we have uh, signals, electromagnetic waves, that they can propagate in both either, either left or right, so we don't have any restriction. But uh, in that region, inside the strong pulse, all waves are uh, restricted to propagate from uh, right to left. Uh, because of the high value of the initial refraction. The medium doesn't support waves with positive true velocity inside that region. But uh, astonishingly, this, the, this whole uh, nice, you know, uh, analogy here that I made with the causal structure of white black holes goes beyond that just, you know, blocking waves and creating horizons. In particular, those horizons also produce particles pretty much like, like black holes, and they also generate entanglement. So, Let's study now this thing. Again, I have the previous picture. And uh, here I need to give you a bit more uh, information about the model. So we need to think about the whole process in the co-moving frame, the co-moving frame to the strong paths. So imagine that we have observers following uh, the strong paths. So what we see is just waves coming and go. And for example, for the white hole case, we will see waves coming and blocked at a certain location. Now, if we show the dispersion relation to the commoving frame, we find that uh, if we go to the asymptotic region, for example, let's forget uh, from here and to the left, if we go far away from the strong pulse and we solve the dispersion relation, we find that we have, for a given frequency, we get four different uh, wave numbers. So that means that the medium uh, supports four different types of waves. So if we compute the group velocities, we find that three of them 
they have negative group velocity and therefore go propagate to the left. And one guy has a positive group velocity, it propagates to the right. The same happens in the other asymptotic region far away from the strong pulse. Again, we have three waves to the left and one to the right. That is a very, uh, um, uh, it is irrespective of the strong pulse. But if we put the strong pulse in the picture, we can interpret this as you know having three ingoing waves towards the white black hole from the right part and one ingoing wave from the left. So these are going to be the input modes. Uh, also we have you know four outgoing waves because they move far away from the from the strong pulse. Uh, to study now the Hawking process, essentially we have to solve this scattering problem. So you can visualize this. Uh, you can think of this as a quantum mechanical textbook uh, exercise where we have some uh, plane waves propagating towards a scattering potential. This is a potential, and we want to find the amplitudes of the uh, scattered waves. So this is essentially what we need to do here. But this is a very complicated problem to do analytically, and in general, it is impossible to find analytical solutions unless we introduce massive approximations. So in this work, we solve this problem uh, numerically by providing appropriate conditions for the green arrows. So let me do an application. So let's say that you know we want to compute what is the mean occupation number in this outgoing flux. This is an outgoing wave to the black hole asymptotic region. So that kind of reminds us of the Hawking mode. So uh, let's take the quantum state of the green arrows to be in the vacuum. So first of all, you know, by scattering, I mean that you know, we need to relate the amplitudes of the red arrows to the green arrows. And essentially, this is, means to write, down, um, uh, to write down equations that connect the creation and annihilation operators of those, of those red with green modes. So the green modes are within, and the red modes are going to be denoted by out. Here, I just write one of them here, uh, the K3. So uh, these coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, are going to be determined by, the by solving the scattering problem, which, uh, as I said, we do that numerically. But imagine for a moment that we know those coefficients. So uh, what I want to compute is that if I put the green arrows in the vacuum state, so I study uh, fluctuations of the electromagnetic field propagating towards the strong uh, the strong pulse. I find that uh, you know uh, we see that you know if, initial, if the initial state is in the vacuum, uh, we think in the Heisenberg picture, so the state doesn't evolve, but, uh, but rather the the operators evolve. So we find that we get a non-zero result for the outgoing flux, and this is essentially you know the the particle creation we see in this in this model here. So we have particle creation by the interaction uh, between the, you know, coming from the interaction of the green arrows with the horizon. Um, and in particular, you know, one can show that this beta coefficient essentially follows a black body spectrum up to some correction here, which is due to dispersive effects. And essentially, this pretty much to a great agreement, it's a thermal spectrum, and one can extract a temperature. One can extract the Hawking temperature, which um, it has been done in this paper, also in, by uh, Unruh involved, um, and they show that you know this uh, uh, this temperature depends on the characteristic of the strong pulse. For example, if U is the speed of the pulse and psi is a parameter uh, that tells us the stiffness of the strong pulse at the horizon. So this is essentially plays the role of the surface gravity. Now our work here focuses mainly on uh, analyzing the um, quantum aspects of this process. So in general, we, we have particle creation in all of the four uh, red arrows. Here I just showed you an example for the green, for this, for this K3 red arrow. Uh, but, but, you know, together with particle creation, we have generation of entanglement. And this is a very important uh, feature of the process because, you know, the whole goal of analog gravity is to uh, experimentally verify the Hawking process. Uh, people have been able to uh, to find uh, thermal generation of particles in uh, classical media. For example, uh, they found excitations of sound waves in the uh, water tanks. This is an experiment done by Unruh, but uh, such such a um, such an experiment has been regarded as very classical. So there is nothing. There is no quantum aspects of the process to be studied, and therefore. 
people still pursue to uh, verify the hotting process in a quantum setup. Um, a very promising setup is this optical uh, optical uh, system that I am discussing. So let's now go and discuss the, the quantum aspects. So for that, I find it useful to um, use a simplified version of the scattering problem. Or if you want, we uh, we found this is one of the merits of this work that we have found a nice clean way to write this complicated messy scattering problem with a linear set of operations very well known in the people doing uh, quantum optics or you know continuous variable systems in quantum information theory. So the analogy goes as follows. Again, we see this. We we see again these three waves. Those are going to be the three green arrows that I showed you earlier. Uh, we have two short wavelength modes. Those are going to be uh, the modes that will generate the Hodgkin radiation at the event horizon. So here, we, those go to the event horizon. They produce a Hodgkin radiation and the Hodgkin partner falling inside the black hole. And uh, we can find that we can mimic, we can model this uh, process here with a two-mode squeezer. Two-mode squeezer is an optical uh, setup uh, which essentially mathematically this transformation here can be uh, expressed by this set of equations. Um, and essentially, you know, this, this uh, uh, operation here generates particles. So if we start here with vacuum fluctuations, we find that we have uh, photon created in this mode and in that mode, and these two modes are going to be entangled as well. Uh, in addition to that, in the, in the Hawking radiation astrophysical black holes, there is another uh, process called um, classical scattering, which is essentially some of the Hawking particles uh, interact with the gravitational potential, and then they go back to the black hole. Uh, and we find that we can also model this classical process by another tool called the beam splitter, which essentially has one reflection, one transmission channel and one reflection channel, and mathematically is described by this uh, set of equations. Um, and now this is this this circuit is drawn only for the black hole. In a couple of slides, I'm going to extend it also to incorporate the white hole. For the moment, I'm just introducing a new tool to uh, describe this uh, scattering problem with very well-known tools uh, with, for which we have analytical expressions. Uh, the important thing before I, uh, the, the second uh, the second important thing that I want to talk before I go to the entanglement is uh, what types of quantum states we consider. So uh, we restrict out, I mean, in general, to fully describe the quantum state, you need to know the density operators. But for bosonic systems, um, like, you know, the modes of an electromagnetic field, or even simpler for a, for a harmonic oscillator, um, the density operator is an infinitely dimensional uh, matrix. So, uh, so in general, it's not easy to, uh, Compute, I mean, it can be difficult to compute analytically observables. So we restrict ourselves with a very nice uh, class of quantum states called Gaussian states, for which all the information about the state can be encoded in the first moments and in the covariance matrix. Uh, this vector A uh, is the vector including all creation and annihilation operators. So if we study just one harmonic oscillator, we just need a pair of creation and annihilation operators. Uh, and here, you know, the, the covariance metrics essentially include uh, the two point function. Uh, it's just written in a nice way to extract, you know, to remove unnecessary information like the mean values and the, uh, the gamma commutation. So it's just, you know, you can think of it at this moment, you can think of it as a nice redefinition of the two point function. So the evolution, you know, once we compute numerically the scattering matrix, the scattering matrix is. It's going to be this uh, matrix that I showed you earlier uh, that contains the elements of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So if we incorporate the other elements to uh, find how the other modes are related to the in modes, we can construct this S matrix. And we can involve this quantum state by just matrix multiplication to the first moment and doing this operation for the, for the two-point function, for the covariance matrix. Uh, here, uh, I use a little bit of jargon so you can forget about that part. Essentially, I'm just, you know, I'm just stating it in case someone has seen that. But, you know, to answer whether a quantum state is, uh, 
is uh, contains entanglement or not, we use the violation of the PPT criterion, which that stands for the positivity of the partially transpose. Um, it's a very well known criterion for which you know it's, it tells you whether a state, a, a quantum state, is separable or not. For the moment, this is not an important thing, so we can forget about that. Um, uh, what I want to say is that you know out of this criterion, we, we can construct a function called logarithmic negativity for which, you know, using that function, we can uh, see whether there is a entanglement or not in a quantum state. And more than that, we can also quantify, we can measure how much entanglement uh, that quantum state contains. So this is going to be very important for this work. Um, okay, now we are at the position of computing style. First of all, let's put all the initial modes, all the green arrows that I showed you to the quantum state. Just vacuum fluctuations going to the white black hole. Uh, we find that in general, out of the six possible by, by partitions or the outgoing red arrows, only three pairs contain a Um We can understand this by this equivalent circuit that I showed you earlier for the black hole case. So the black hole incorporated included only this part. Now with the black with the white hole, we also have to put the other the other uh, to extend it. And essentially, you know, this, this box is here. Uh, they model the particle creation of the horizon. So here, that squeezer corresponds to the particle creation happening at the, at the black hole event horizon. And this corresponds to the particle creation happening at the white hole horizon. And here we have the classical uh, gravitational scattering, which now in the optical case will be scattering due to dispersion. But in the astrophysical case, this is a gravitational scattering, the beam split. Um, okay, so these are going to be our initial modes, and the, in the output of this squeezer, we have the green line, which is the Hawking mode, and the Hawking partner. The difference is that, you know, the, the green line will go to our detector, to the sky glass, but the orange line will go to the white hole, because it's the Hawking mode staying inside the pulse and going to interact with the white, white hole horizon. So at the output of the squeezer, we have the generation of entanglement and particle creation. That's, you, that's why you see colors only at the output of the horizon. Um, um, OK, so some important comments here. Wow. There is a time generated between the Hawking mode and the Hawking partner. And there is also a time generated between uh, this mode coming out of the white hole with the, with the, with the other uh, mode uh, generated to the white hole. So, this entanglement is going to be the strongest one. So this is the Hawking pair generated by the white hole. This pair has the strongest entanglement, and it is this uh, pink uh, here. And uh, for the Hawking mode and the Hawking partner, we see the entanglement has this kind of pattern. So it has a maximum here, and then it drops again with frequency. So first of all, we need to understand that with, uh, at lower frequencies, we have more production of particles. And this is because, you know, it follows a Bose-Einstein distribution, the particle creation here. It's a thermal uh, uh, mechanism, so it, it follows with frequency. And the same pattern is expected by a document to be followed. Um, the reason why this guy drops here is because uh, the Hawking mode gets entanglement, gets entangled with the other mode to the white hole case. Uh, and to the white hole side. And the more these guys, they get entangled, the less uh, the entanglement the reduces between the Hawking mode and the Hawking partner. And that's why we see this drop here. So it's like the two squeezers, the two particle, uh, you know, the two particle creation generators, if you want, they compete with each other. So the more entanglement we have here, the less uh, we get here. And that kind of thing uh, balances around this mass. Uh, but as we as we go to higher frequencies, those two squeezers uh, produce less particles, and therefore uh, you know they kind of decouple. So they kind of see the same input here and here. So that's why the two the two uh, logarithmic negativities uh, merge. And the same will happen if I plot here the intensity. So the intensity of the Hawking mode uh, will will be close to that. Um, a more realistic scenario. So that was for vacuum fluctuations. A more realistic case is to consider the background noise. Um, because, you know, there's going to be an apparatus in the, the laboratory and we will have some background noise. 
So let's see how this can affect the entanglement. So the initial state is not anymore the vacuum, but rather is a mixed state where uh, this is expressed in the Fock representation. And N is the um, mean occupation number of the thermal quanta of the, if you want, the, the photons of the, of the, of the room. Um, if we compute again the logarithmic negativity, we find that let's compute the logarithmic negativity for the strongest entanglement pair. And in general, we find that in the absence of noise, we get what, what we found in the previous, uh, the previous slide. It's always uh, strictly non-zero, but it decays at larger frequencies. But once we put some noise, that guy reduces uh, significantly. And also, there's a cutoff beyond which completely vanishes. So up to that frequency, there is no entanglement there anymore. And therefore, this is not a good a setup to study the Hawking process because there are no quantum features to be, to be measured. And in fact, the more we increase the noise, the you know the the fastest the logarithmic negativity decays and the, the window for observability of the quantum aspects decreases significantly. So this is a very uh, I mean if the room temperature is high enough that that phenomenon is even more important and uh, that restricts significantly the observation of the of the quantum aspects. So a promising avenue is to stimulate the Hawking process instead of studying piping fluctuations on top of the environmental noise, let's, let's uh, take a non-vacuum initial state for the, for the green arrows that I showed you earlier. Uh, one candidate is to consider coherent states. Those are quantum states generated by adding this operator to the vacuum. And in the number states, in the four phases, if you want, uh, they can be written in that way. Um, that those states succeed in increasing the intensity of the Hawking radiation. So that is good because uh, we can make measurements of the Hawking mode. However, they do, they do not affect the entanglement. So the same entanglement we find for vacuum, the same entanglement we will get for coherent states. So these states is good, are good to observe the Hawking intensity, but not the quantum aspects of the, of the Hawking effect. Another set of states is the single mode squeezed states. So those states are generated by acting to the vacuum by this operator. And in the Fock representation, that is the resulting state. R here is the intensity of the single mode squeezer. So if I put here R equal to zero, I get I get just the vacuum. So uh, so R determines the amount of, of, of squeezing. Um, we find that this kind of states, we can increase the intensity of the Hawking radiation as we uh, can do with coherent states. But on top of that, we can also enhance the generated entanglement. So let's let's go back to the previous plot. R i is this uh, uh, is 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 the amplitude of the single mode squeezer that that has to do with the initial state we input, and we find that you know for a given value of noise. If there is no initial squeezing, so if the input is just vacuum on top of the environmental noise, we get this blue line, which is, you know, drops uh, rapidly. And there is a cutoff beyond which we see no quantum aspects. But if we uh, include initial squeezing, the entanglement generated by the Hawking uh, optical black hole uh, increases significantly. And then uh, also the cutoff moves to the right which is good because there's greater window of observability. And uh, you know, that, that behavior is monotonic, uh, monotonic with the initial squeezing. So the more we increase the initial squeezing, the more entanglement we get out of the Hawking process and also the window increases. So therefore that, that proves that the stimulated, you know, the stimulated process with a single mode squeeze state increases the quantum aspects of the, of the optical um, white black hole. So let me close with a few take home messages. So uh, the first point I want to uh, emphasize is that, you know, uh, what is important for the Hawking process is not the actual black hole, but rather the causal structure created by the black hole. And this universality can be used, can be, you know, taken into our advantage to reproduce this causal structure in laboratory setups in order to prove the Hawking effect. 
So uh, my first point uh, follows on these lines by saying that you know the black hole causal structure can be reproduced in dispersive uh, flowing media. Uh, operationally thinking, we can say that black holes and white holes can be thought of as two mode squeezers, uh, which is a very well known uh, operation uh, for people working in optics. And the final point uh, that I want to uh, conclude with, which is also the, the result of this work, is that you know, stimulating the hotting, uh, the, simulating the hotting process with a single mode squeeze state is a promising strategy for the detection of the hotting effect, as it emphasizes both the hotting intensity and the entanglement generated by the hotting process. So this is still a work in progress, but uh, one part of it has been already submitted uh, in a later version to the archives and also for publication. So uh, with this uh, thoughts, I would like to close and thank you for your attention. Well, questions here? Yeah. I, I have one, yes. Uh, Dimitri, well, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was very really nice. And um, do you know which are the current limitations, experimental limitations, to, uh, to use these squeeze modes and uh, observe this entanglement and also yeah. uh, okay. process? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. First of all, uh, because we are in dispersive media, it's hard for people to find a hotting intensity which follows a black body spectrum. We have deviations, and that is already a limitation. But regarding the quantum aspects, uh, a squeezing parameter of two uh, is, I think, a little bit high. So probably we are not we will not be able to have a lot of initial squeezing. So we are going to be closer to closer to this side. Which means less endowment produced. <laughs> How do you prevent experimentally the squeezing? Um, this, uh, so that, yeah, that's, that's also another good question. So people have uh, found these are technologies in, uh, in, uh, in uh, quantum optics using crystals. So people can use crystals to uh, change the quantum state of light. And that's how they generate single mode squeezer. And from the single mode squeezer, using beam splitters like you know mirrors, they can produce two mode squeezer. But it's a technique using crystals. Yeah, I'm not I'm not expert on that, but that's what I know. And uh, so, if you study the, the this phenomenon with single mode squeezer modes, no states. Yes. How well do you reduce the the astrophysic, uh, astrophysical uh, setting uh, in which the OB radiation is generated by two parking states. That is, yeah, that, that is precisely the point. So, so, so we know that, you know, using single mode squeezer, we are not going to, so first of all, the initial state is still unentangled. So we, we don't, we don't input any entanglement here. We just change cleverly the initial state to enhance the entanglement produced. So, the statement is that you know all entanglement is going to be generated by the optical setup. So no matter if we input you know vacuum or if we put signal mode we state, the entanglement, all of it is going to be generated by the by the horizon. And this can be seen by you know if we if we take if we take the horizon. <laughs> so there are two squeezes. One squeezer is this one, and the other squeezer is 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 the horizon. So this one. So if we take this squeezer to be zero. We find no entanglement in the final state. So the statement is that you know we essentially stimulate the process to make it easier, you know, accessible to the lab. But but we know that all of, all of the entanglement is going to come from the from the, the, from the electron physics. Yes. Okay. Yes. But the, the, the resulting radiation in the case of astrophysical black hole is characterized only by the detector. No? Yes. It's a purely thermal yes. uh, emission. That's in right. In this case, are you are you sure that you find this? This physics, that, uh, I mean, you, uh, but, but, mm -hmm. you would get uh, a radiation which is uh, perfectly thermalized, or you have some additional features uh, coming from the, the choice of the input state. Uh, no, that's that's a good question. So, uh, the it will it will depend uh, in the squeezing amplitude in this squeezing amplitude, but uh, but. Uh, so this can always be uh, been removed because we know we know. In, in other words, we can extract 
we can extract the Hawking temperature because we know we know how this will affect the final intensity. So if we can subtract this, we can extract the physics of the horizon. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, this was the last talk of the morning. I thought we are hungry. So we see each other at the three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Flavio? Andreu, hola, ¿me escuchas? Ah, no, se quedó grabando la sesión por si quieren pararla.